Si vous voulez bien, on va commencer. Il n'y a pas de quorum physique, euh, mais le quorum virtuel étant largement atteint par. So we're going to start. There is no physical quorum, but there's a virtual quorum for more than 100 people who are really waiting. So we will start immediately. I would like to thank you very much to be here today, even if the room is only slowly filling up. Everyone who is here is actually indeed welcome. So I'll give you a few words to present this event, which is uh, and a series of events in which it's situated. So it's an in event by the Chain International the Architecture of Development Finance that was set up at Ferdi about one year ago now. And it's accelerated its uh, activities in the lead up to the June uh, summit on a new financial pact, which will be so, uh, organized in Paris on the 9th of June. So the series of events uh, as the support of this uh, uh, very institution, the, treasure, the Treasury and the Ministry of uh, European and Foreign Affairs, which has supported us while totally respecting the independence of uh, whatever is being said during those meetings. So it's a totally independent uh, initiative by Ferdi through this chair, so as to express uh, a, a point of view of French experts who have a very deep knowledge and experience of uh, the areas we're talking about, who can then express their views in totally independently. So we had two previous events. Uh, the first one was about uh, the beneficiaries of uh, public, de public development uh, finance. Uh, so it wondered why we should develop uh, uh, global policies and for whom. And you will find uh, the um, papers for those documents on the website. Uh, you will find them on English and on French. Uh, so if ever you want to peruse our website, you will find all this information and all the papers of our previous sessions. You'll find uh, an abstract of those papers and also the long version of the papers and in both in French and in English. And the same goes for the second event that we also organized uh, under the chair of Philippe Lewerou, who is the uh, head of, of this chair. And so the second event was about climate finance with a document called uh, Time to Clean Out. And we also organized a meeting on uh, the potential road of the World Bank to finance uh, climate adaptation, for example, when compared to other entities and institutions, and also uh, when compared to the, the different standards that we need to step to set up. And we'll come back to the question of standards today. And actually today, which is still the third uh, meeting of this series, before a fourth one that will be about debt at the Bank of France uh, on the 7th, on Friday. And then the last meeting, which will be uh, dedicated to the financing of the private sector that will uh, take place at the Hotel of Industry. And then the very last meeting on the 26th, which will be uh, organized in Clermont-Ferrand about the uh, efficiency of, uh, of conditional financing. And all those events are actually virtually transmitted uh, via Zoom, which is also uh, very convenient for us. But we also have some physical presence, like today, because nothing is as good as meeting in person. And so everyone who's here has actually also the opportunity to take the floor. So today, uh, we will be looking into two different documents, which are different, but also uh, interrelated. The first one will be about the fragmentation of uh, development uh, policies, fragmentation and diversification, with a main document that will be presented by Alain Leroy, who is with us today, and Jean-Michel Severino, who is actually stuck in uh, his train at the moment, so will only be uh, with us virtually um, online. So Alain Leroy is a French ambassador and former uh, Undersecretary General for Peacekeeping at the United Nations. He's had a very strong consultative uh, role uh, in France uh, through uh, lots of international uh, 
conferences, and I would also really like to thank him to all his contributions to the work of our chair. And then Jean-Michel Severino, who is the co-author of our first paper on the uh, uh, aim of uh, development finance, uh, which was uh, the, the, the theme of our first meeting. Well, everyone knows him. He's the chairman of Invest and Partners. He's the ex-director of the AFD and is now a senior fellow at Ferdi here. So to facilitate our debates, we have a very uh, rich and wide uh, panel, and that's why maybe the first part of our meeting will be probably a bit longer than the second one. The second part will be talking about uh, specific earmarked taxes for development, and we'll speak more specifically about the jet fuel tax. And this will rest on a paper that will be um, presented to you that was written by Vianney Dekit, who is a professor of economics at the University of Clermont and uh, scientific director of Ferdi. And then we'll also have further comments from Grégoire and other people that I will actually introduce to you uh, later in this second part. As I said, for the first part, we have a, a very uh, wide uh, panel. So we are welcoming Tertius Zongo, who's the former prime minister of Burkina Faso and the director of the Sahel chair of Ferdi. Online with us is Madame Arlette Soudan-Nono, who is the minister of the environment for, and sustainable development and, and for the Republic of Congo and is a very strong activist of, uh, for the environment in uh, the Congo Basin countries. So we'll be very happy to hear her on this topic of fragmentation. We also, well, well Natalie Napalm will not be with us, but we will welcome Isa Sanogo, who is the United Nations resident coordinator in Madagascar is in the south of the country and i hope he will be with us uh, i think he's on with us online also serge de galet a former ambassador uh, and former director of the uh, prospective and innovation foundation and is now the director at the fondation uh, tunisie pour le développement tunisia for development we also welcome olivier cataneo who was already with us uh, on the, in the last meeting. And we will probably question a few of the conclusions that we will be presenting to you. And Olivier is the head of unit policy analysis and strategy at the Development Cooperation Directorate of the OECD. And finally, we have a, an eminent a specialist of earmarked funds, uh, Bernard Reinsberg, who is the reader at the University of Glasgow and he's written uh, papers on this area. And it's very important as well to have this university post of view, this academic uh, perspective uh, to uh, tell us about like the, the technique, technical robustness of the propositions that will be made. So now, without further ado, I will uh, give the floor to Alain Leroy who is going to present the document that is co-authored with Jean-Michel Severino. And I believe Jean-Michel is online with us. Absolutely. Yes, apparently he is. So thank you very much. We are now starting our debate discussion. I would like also to thank everyone who's joined us today, all our personalities. I think the General Inspector of uh, State still Teofilawa, who is here as an observator, but he can uh, an observer, but he can also uh, take the floor later on if he wants. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Thank you for this presentation. Just a few words of introduction. For, for the, just first, I'd like to say uh, humbly that a modest diplomat uh, to speak in front of experts like you, but Serge Degalais is in the same category, and so there's at least two of us. And then 
uh, this uh, paper that was co-authored by Jean-Michel Severino, but there's also many other people who actually contributed, especially many people from 30, like Mathieu, uh, Diane, etc. It's like a collective work with uh, lots of elements in it. So as you said, two questions were already resolved by the previous uh, sessions. Why are financing and for whom? And so now we're moving on to a next question is the fragmentation of uh, uh, public uh, uh, of OAD. So fragmentation and diversification of ODA, sorry. So it's not new. It's some, there's already lots of documentation about this area. So it's very difficult maybe to analyze it even further. But that's what we try to do with Jean-Michel. We try to actually uh, put numbers on this fragmentation to explain the root causes of this fragmentation to analyze the efficiency or lack of efficiency of this fragmentation and also to give maybe potential uh, possibilities options to reduce fragmentation and then lastly we suggested that maybe we could have like a, an overseeing uh, an oversight entity to do benchmarking and evaluation of those uh, uh, institutions and to actually maybe take our inspiration from what we call core in French, which is the uh, uh, retirement um, analysis uh, center, which gathers together all social partners and analyzes all the different elements to, to have a good proposition for retirement. So I'll start uh, with a few key figures. Uh, in case you do not know them. First, um, ODA has, has uh, risen up uh, quite significantly uh, recently. In 2001, it was 80 uh, billion, and in 2021, it was 200 billion. And we can see there's three main components, bilateral uh, agency, multilateral agencies, and multi-bilateral agencies and multi-bilateral means that they are uh, earmarked funds that whose management is given to multilateral agencies by bilateral donors and so all the three types have actually uh, increased uh, since uh, over the past decades and actually the uh, multi multi-bilateral assistance was almost non-existent and now represents about 15% of funds. So, and this is to the detriment of bilateral or multilateral assistance, even though if uh, bilateral assistance, as you will see in our uh, paper, is the one that is uh, leading uh, and is the most, most more prominent than the other types of assistance. So now to give you figures, uh, including all agents, funds, entities, institutions. Well, I believe this is an analysis by the World Bank. And uh, in our document, we quote the following uh, figures. The number of bilateral donors moved from 25 2000 to 43 in 2015. And then within them, the number of agencies moved up from 145 to 411. So that's the number of bilateral agencies. Well, the number of agencies uh, that are multilateral moved up from 46 to 91. So in 2000, there was 191 agencies. And today we have 502. So you can see there's a very strong fragmentation So this fragmentation is very well known, is the number of agencies or entities, also within institutions, there's also a lot of fragmentation. We know about the World Bank, for example, with, and also within the United Nations, there's uh, different agencies. But even in China, for example, who is like an, a newcomer, there's also a very strong fragmentation in China. For example, in China, it will uh, intervene directly through its ministry or through policy banks, through 
uh, Lexing Bank of China, the a development bank. Uh, it also has a public trade banks, an investment bank, and many other institutions, which actually uh, which actually leads me to the question of debt. It also, there's also a common framework for debt treatment, where we wanted to actually make sure that China would be working with this, and not that only European taxpayers. So we wanted China to integrate this common framework, and it's actually an open question that's still uh, current today. And there China said, no, it's not a public debt. For example, the China Development Bank is not a public institution, so we do not uh, take it into account in our debt, although we know that this uh, bank is actually steered by public institution, but this allows China to actually play down its debt. And this contributes to fragmentation. Bon, sur les raisons de la fragmentation. Now, regarding the reasons of that uh, fragmentation, or rather just sorry, a final word, because we did mention it at the uh, previous uh, session, but this uh, fragmentation in the area of climate finance is uh, particularly stark. We actually said that there were 91 green funds that had been uh, set up, 81 of them are still active today, and it's uh, urgent to solve this particular issue. I can't remember the uh, name of uh, the uh, paper, but climate finance is an area where there is also a huge amount of uh, fragmentation. Okay, so that being said, just two uh, words, a couple of words on the reasons of this uh, fragmentation. Uh, first of all, there is a greater diversity of issues that we try to tackle, and it makes sense when a new problem comes up, then of course you can set up a new fund. It was the uh, case with uh, AIDS in the uh, 1980s. It was a disease that didn't exist, so a new fund uh, popped up. And that allows you to have a dedicated expertise, and uh, it's a fragmentation that has uh, some uh, some sense and which makes, well, well no, sorry, makes uh, perfect sense. But there are many other reasons that explain this uh, fragmentation. And it also raises a uh, lot of questions. For example, what about consistency? We have different institutions who have different funds. Is there not an overlap? What does that mean from an efficiency uh, perspective? And what does that mean from a cost perspective as well? Now, as I said earlier, a lot of has been uh, written, a lot has been said on uh, this uh, issue of uh, fragmentation. I'd like to share some of the findings, actually. The studies show that uh, greater fragmentation lead to the increase of overall costs with the increase of fixed, fixed costs and a greater number also of uh, recommendations for beneficiary countries, which uh, sometimes are contradictory. And then, Fragmentation can also uh, lead to an overlap and to make uh, funding uh, and financing less uh, effective. And so there's a risk that uh, everybody intervenes on the short term to prove that they are useful, that what they're doing has an impact. So fragmentation also leads to greater administrative, administrative costs, and it also makes uh, the whole situation much less transparent. Okay, so that's it for uh, all of the issues that uh, pertain to this uh, greater uh, fragmentation, but this is stuff that you've already heard uh, before. Now, I think it's interesting to look also at uh, the upsides of uh, fragmentation in the uh, Summary, you say that uh, fragmentation does have a few upsides, or rather you say it's not all negative, uh, to use your own words, but a, uh, well, what is useful is to have uh, you know special funds, and that means uh, more uh, uh, fragmentation. There could also be synergies built between uh, funds. That's also a uh, possibility. And when it comes to uh, beneficiary uh, countries, one can also argue that it gives them a bit more weight in the uh, negotiations because there's a greater number of uh, financing uh, sources to uh, tap into. Oui. 
For this fragmentation to be uh, positive, we need to uh, first look at what the optimal level of fragment fragmentation might be. But of course, this is a, a very difficult calculation to, to make. You can't really decide uh, mathematically what is good for the whole world. But there are a few um, mixes that one can look at. Sorry, I'm looking through my notes. And yes, I'd like to talk about uh, some of the ideas that have emerged recently. First of all, I'd like to look at uh, the avenues for more consistency and more efficiency. So, for example, how can we streamline the uh, number of uh, funds? Can we bring funds closer together? And uh, how can we make sure that uh, the uh, decisions that are made at COP or elsewhere are actually enacted by the agencies? So just a quick word, and then I'll hand over to Jean-Michel. I hope that uh, he can hear us. Just a final word to say that uh, our first proposal is to reduce the number of uh, funds, which is, of course, obvious, but it's a recommendation that many people have uh, come up uh, with earlier. We heard it on uh, Green Funds a few days ago. It is, of course, the most radical and the most obvious uh, solution, but very few people actually go for it for technical reasons, for governance reasons, for political reasons, etc. But we could say, look, before setting up a new fund, you have to check whether there's something that already exists that is similar uh, in uh, the current uh, landscape. Maybe there should also be a sunset clause after 10 years, you know, we could take stock of the situation. And then there are some instances where we have, uh, under COP15, for example, not created a uh, new fund. And this has uh, lent uh, more strength to the already uh, existing funds. And just a final, final word, because I see that I'm running out of time, uh, a word on uh, transparency. Jean-Michel will talk about the role of uh, OECD in a minute, but I think that OECD with its uh, framework, with its DAC, already has uh, brought a lot of transparency to uh, the whole uh, process of international development fi financing. Since 2010, there are a lot of examples that uh, come to mind. For example, accounting for peace and uh, sustainability operation and their financing. It's very important that this is checked and this is done by the OECD. Secondly, more clarification also on the uh, cost of uh, refugees for uh, donor countries. And then the grant equivalent rule for all uh, DAC countries. And also more consistency for uh, uh, debt uh, relief under ODA, and then the uh, other measures that were taken by the uh, OECD uh, DAC uh, committee. That was very helpful in terms of uh, transparency, but I understand that Jean-Michel is online, that he's probably heard what I've just said, and he's now going to take the floor to build on what I've humbly said uh, so far and talk about OECD and other such organizations. Jean-Michel, over to you. Jean-Michel, can you hear us? Yes, can, yes, 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 I can hear you. Um, you have uh, the floor. We'll be happy to hear from you, uh, although you are online this afternoon. So the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much and uh, good afternoon, one and all. Apologies for not actually being able to be with you in uh, in uh, Bercy, uh, in Paris, uh, this afternoon. Sadly, uh, there was a strike and my train could not make it to Paris. Okay, I'm going to talk about uh, the uh, topic that uh, Alain has uh, put on the table. The way in which I'd like to wrap up on uh, fragmentation is uh, to do so with uh, a lot of uh, 
in, in a very humble way. The uh, diagnosis for fragmentation has been performed uh, many years ago. Um, and uh, we've known now for a long time that fragmentation is an issue and a lot of solutions have been suggested and to some extent implemented. For example, we've tried to uh, stop the creation of new funds, remove older funds, create more transparency, improve also aid uh, coordination, as well as uh, reform whole sections of the uh, multilateral uh, system, such as the one UN uh, program. But we need to be very humble because when you look at uh, what has been done uh, so far, it seems that all the attempts undertaken have led to a greater increase in the number of funds and a greater uh, fragmentation. One UN is a case in point, even though it did have some uh, positive uh, spillovers, but any effort attempting to restructure and to streamline the uh, activities of uh, the uh, UN is uh, very complicated. It creates a lot of red tape. And more generally speaking, aid coordination is a huge bureaucratic undertaking, both for agencies and for um, beneficiary countries, and likewise for bilateral and multilateral players. And we also know that uh, institutions um, have an important role to play. So we need to be very humble when approaching this uh, particular issue of uh, fragmentation. We need to be wary of uh, radical uh, solutions. And if it's so hard, it's because there are some root causes that are difficult to uh, address for political reasons sometimes, but also for technical reasons sometimes uh, as well. So we conclude our work by saying, you know, very humbly and a bit uh, with a heavy heart that uh, there is uh, not going to be a, a huge change in international uh, governance, or at least not in the short term. And none of us uh, are expecting a third world war that will then, uh, you know, allow us to allow us to start us afresh, so to speak, as we did after World War II. So the issue is now to look at how we can have better tools to uh, make the uh, right decisions when it comes to international uh, and global governance. Now, we understand, of course, that uh, what we suggest or part of what we uh, suggest will maybe not increase fragmentation, but, nets, but, but nevertheless, lead to extra costs. In other words, we want to have a technical and a political uh, unit that follows up on this uh, issue. In other words, we want to bring together all the players, uh, bilateral players, multilateral players, civil society, of course, to take a closer look at international governance, to do that in a participatory manner and to uh, undertake uh, uh, work uh, managed under this uh, technical and political unit. And uh, this uh, unit would have a mandate, one of analyzing the flows and the institutions to look at the uh, performance, to uh, compare the performance uh, between uh, the uh, different funds and to uh, highlight inconsistencies. Now, we know that uh, this uh, work is undertaken already by uh, the, uh, uh, the DAC committee at uh, OECD. We know that uh, Europan also undertake, undertakes uh, such words, work, sorry, the UN, the British Woods institutions. There are many different areas where uh, this work is already being performed. At the UN, for example, there is some analysis that is already carried out, but we do not have a single body where all the players come together, where they can build on the work that has already been done and to kind of bundle everything uh, together to have uh, a uh, clear picture and also an area where uh, consensus, consensus can be uh, built.
earlier, we talked about uh, the uh, pension uh, committee in France. Now, that's what we have in France. We have a uh, body that uh, comes up with an analysis on the stock take uh, and a consensus on the analysis and the stock take, but it doesn't actually tell you what to do. Now, what we hope is that uh, this uh, analysis, this uh, objective analysis will uh, lead to more motivation and will push people uh, to change and maybe having some safeguards when it comes to creating new funds. Now, of course, there's a whole debate on where such a body would be uh, set up. Now, there are three possibilities. The first uh, traditional, let's say, uh, avenue uh, would be to call upon the DAC and ask it to uh, extend its uh, scope because non-OECD members do not officially take part in DAC meetings. So that's the first uh, possibility, extending the, uh, the scope of uh, the uh, OECD uh, DAC committee so that the whole international community can really build on the vast amount of work that's uh, been undertaken by DAC. Second possibility, we could take a look at uh, the uh, UN and uh, look at UNDP, for example, and uh, what they're doing. But we know that if uh, the uh, CAD is known for being uh, efficient, although not always uh, representative because of its uh, makeup, uh, well, the uh, UN, it's the opposite. The UN is known for not always being very efficient, but for uh, representing all countries around the world. Third possibility, we could set up a new uh, body. This is why we have made uh, this uh, suggestion of turning to the G20, which uh, doesn't have any uh, standing body or committee, and therefore might be reluctant to uh, set up such a body. But the upside of the G20 is that it's uh, a forum for international uh, debate, and one that is uh, perceived as a uh, legitimate, or at any rate, more than the uh, OECD uh, DAC. And the G20 is also seen as more modern in its uh, lineup, in its uh, makeup. Of course, what we don't want to do is to lead to the fragmentation of uh, the, uh, the government. So as you can see, there is no silver bullet solution out there. All have their uh, downsides and when you take a look at uh, the uh, evolution of uh, aid coordination, you can actually see how difficult it's been to coordinate aid over time. The high level dialogue on aid efficiency uh, was uh, a uh, very much uh, a long winded uh, process and with uh, a uh, dilution when it comes to actually uh, uh, actually uh, fleshing out some actions. So we're very humble when we uh, look uh, at uh, all of this. The uh, diagnosis is very simple, but the solutions, however, are much more complicated. So we await a lot, we expect a lot from today's uh, discussions to... Uh, to uh, set the course for the future and maybe try to think ahead of the future and how we could manage this uh, whole issue of uh, proliferation, one that has uh, uh, increased uh, significantly over the uh, years. And the Convention on Biodiversity was a good case in point where uh, there was this whole matter of creating a new fund. So this is something that I want everyone to uh, bear in mind because it's uh, that's also the risk of fragmentation. So thank you very much for your kind attention. I'm now going to hand the floor back to you in the room.
Well, thank you very much, uh, Jean-Michel. We are very sad not to have you here in uh, Bercy, but thank you for taking the floor from home. So you've heard from Alain Leroy, from uh, Jean-Michel Severino, and you've heard uh, essentially the uh, the meat of the report that uh, they've uh, drafted. Now, we are going to hear from uh, uh, people who are designers and uh, practitioners alike, and uh, in the uh, report, there's a whole diagnosis on uh, the uh, fragmentation. This fragmentation seems very high, but it's also explainable to a certain extent. What's the optimal level of fragmentation? Uh, but we know that we won't be able to merge all of the funds, and that's not what we want to do anyway. But nonetheless, it would be interesting to have a body to coordinate and to assess what different institutions are doing. So it's on this particular aspect of this proposal that uh, we would like to uh, focus on, the avenues uh, for uh, a better coordination in the future. And this is what we would like to hear uh, your feedback on. What about this uh, body that would coordinate aid and uh, monitor aid effectiveness? So I'm going to ask our speakers to focus not so much on the diagnosis, but more so on the uh, proposals that have been made. We're going to start off with uh, the uh, Prime Minister, and then we'll hear from Ms. Arlette Soudan. And of course, we are very uh, lucky in, the, in that we have a representative from the uh, Treasury, uh, and he'll take the floor in a minute. His name is Stefan Zemlitsky. Oh, I'm terribly sorry, but I have to leave in about 10 minutes to the Senate. The government has been called to the Senate, and therefore I won't be able to stay with you for very long. Oh, well, then we're going to give you the priority, Ms. Sudan. Yes, I am Minister of Environment in Congo, uh, and I hope that you were able to hear me. But I just wanted to tell you that uh, I have to leave in 10 minutes. Yes, you have the floor, um, Madam Minister. Thank you very much. Thank you to everybody. I'm terribly sorry I wasn't able to make it to Bercy. Our schedules are very busy, but I'm delighted to have this opportunity, the second opportunity, to speak about this very major subject, i.e. the diversification and the uh, fragmentation of uh, public finance. I'm also going to talk about the subject from uh, the perspective of uh, a Minister of uh, Environment. Uh, I'd like to draw your attention to five different points uh, that I think are very important as a uh, Minister in Charge of Environment and Sustainable Development and the Congo Basin. I have uh, um, uh, the responsibility of coordinating 15 different countries that are involved around the Congo Basin. And we have a climate uh, uh, council. And for about seven years now, I am in charge of the secretariat of these 15 countries. Um, so to go to the first point, i.e. fragmentation of uh, financing. I think this is a problem because when it comes to ecosystems, uh, I think we need a more comprehensive uh, financing. And very often uh, when we talk about uh, uh, climate funding, we talk about uh, funding for biodiversity. And secondly, I think that uh, Financing should be trans-border. We initiated, for instance, the Blue Fund for the Congo Basin, which is a um, judicial fund, which is uh, in uh, a multilateral development bank. And of course, all of the processes are transparent when it comes to investment plans, etc., to the tune of $10 billion today. And we focus on blue and green colonies. And this is because the 15 countries represent a major uh, source of uh, clean air for the planet and also uh, home to a huge variety of biodiversity. And so this bank mobilizes the funds 
and also manages uh, the criteria for eligibility for the various pro projects and helps us manage the very long and complicated procedures uh, when it comes to accessing funds to finance our national and integral funds uh, projects. And of course, many countries are involved in this. And I'd like now to talk about the stakes at hand when it comes to economic development and sustainable development, which of course go on hand in hand. We have to be able to reconcile the two because they interact with each other and they're closely related to each other because the social, the environmental and economic aspects are in fact the triptych of sustainable development and when it comes to the climate commission uh, in the congo basin we're two months away from organizing a summit uh, on the forests of the great basins the congo the mekong and the Amazon Basin. I just visited uh, uh, Indonesia, I came back yesterday, and in Indonesia, which is home to the uh, Borneo Mekong Basin, while well, we were able to mobilize many states in Asia, and I also visited Brazil, where with the return of President Lula, there's a huge mobilization to prepare this uh, major summit on these issues that are very timely. And so this is what I wanted to talk to you uh, today. So this major summit that is in preparation, we have the Congo Basin, which represents 80% of the biodiversity on the planet. And we want to bring together climate issues which demand uh, require a lot of uh, financing and also the questions of biodiversity which also require huge financing because all of the three basins together represent 80 percent of the biodiversity in the world and we also represent uh, uh, economic growth to the tune of 1 billion uh, 1.5 billion uh, dollars uh, that covers the populations across these three basins. And so under the ages of the United Nations, which is championing this uh, uh, summit that will be held in June in Brazzaville, we're also working with the African Union. And in the framework of the Africa uh, dialogue series, in order to pave the way for the future for free movement of goods. Well, we believe that all of these environmental issues must be taken into consideration when dealing with commercial issues. What I wanted to say by this is that when we talk about diversification, my country, the Republic of Congo, has decided to invest in fossil fuels and now we're being asked to disengage from this in order to protect the planet, that's obvious. And so we need to come up with a moratorium, as we did for coal, etc., towards and to work towards uh, energy transition. But when it comes to the Paris Agreement, there's uh, Article 5, there's uh, the process of reduction of emissions and this helps us to develop sovereign carbon credit markets today this is a voluntary and rather unregulated market and this in turn leads to the diversification and fragmentation of public financing So to have access to sovereign 
credit carbon as is stipulated by the Paris Agreement is very important and today we're facing a difficulty because the uh, voluntary market of carbon credit is a voluntary market and it's a very unregulated field and so for me it seems rather unfair uh, that the ecosystemic services by rendered by these three basins is not taken into account when it comes to these kinds of mechanisms. So for this transition, we need to do away with all of the binding aspects of what has been decided. And this is why the summit on the three basins and the governance uh, mechanisms that will come emerge from this uh, summit will help us on a global scale to integrate the financing of these three uh, basins uh, into other mechanisms that have already been developed by uh, the United Nations and other actors who have collaborated with these um, emerging states and these states who are looking to move towards an energy transition. So this is a rather brief summary of uh, what I wanted to say. I've just been reminded that I need to uh, leave very soon. Uh, the government, in fact, has been convened uh, at uh, 3.30 and I will need about five minutes to go by foot to uh, the Senate. I, I hope, however, that I have been able to contribute some elements to this reflection and thank you for giving me the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Minister. I wouldn't want to delay you. You've brought, a bit, brought up many important uh, issues. If you were to just give us one recommendation to solve this issue of fragmentation, So if you had one recommendation to make in order to optimize all of the potential resources, what would be this recommendation? Thank you. So very quickly. What I'd like to say is that we have to reduce fragmentation of public policy in order to pave the way for sustainable and quick growth of productivity. Fragmentation also represents the risk for recipient countries that are vulnerable to, that have been affected by various climate shocks, and the most recent one being COVID-19. So in I think we need to fight against fragmentation in three fields, priority fields, in the field of commercial trade, in the field of debt, and in the field of uh, climate uh, action. So I spoke about all of these three various aspects uh, earlier in a very brief way and a concise way. But specifically on climate change, I think we need collective action. because that is indispensable to solve this climate crisis. Because we need collective investments to fight against this challenge. If not, we're going to have to face an increasing number of climate disasters and rising risks. And once again, I'm speaking as Minister of Environment, the agreement that came off uh, COP27 with the creation of a loss and damages fund shows that this is possible. So that's what I wanted to say to you very quickly. We really need to change our uh, manner of uh, consumption and we also need to respect the commitments we make. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go back to what you said in our discussions. Uh, 
So thank you for being with us. You're free to leave now. And now we're going to listen to uh, Mr. Tertius Zongo, former Prime Minister of Burkina Faso and Director of the Sahel Chair. So over to you. Thank you, Patrick. I have about 10 minutes, I think. We have many other speakers. <laughs> so I think about eight to 10 minutes for each speaker, right? First and foremost, let me congratulate Jean-Michel and Alain for their paper. Jean-Michel has in fact summarized the whole situation extremely well. The diagnosis on fragmentation is a very well known one. And now how do we move forward? Well, that's not easy. I think we need to be realistic and practical when it comes to looking at the solutions that they've proposed. So in my eight minutes, let me talk from the point of view of recipient countries. So what does fragmentation represent for these recipient countries? Let me just say a couple more words on the diagnosis, on the observations they made. And I'm going to put it in my own words. My first observation, and I'll go back to a term that I like very much, the world, in fact, today is an orphan of a collective vision. And when we say that, they're referring to today's multilateralism, which is, in fact, has been undermined. So when we go to the depth of this reflection, the main instrument to maintain pace, that is multilateralism today. But when you see that this multilateralism isn't functioning well, what do we do with these problems that we cannot solve? Because when you talk about peace, there's also development. There is no development without any peace. So let's go back to this very political aspect where we see that multilateralism has been undermined, cannot play its role. So you can see how difficult it is to come up with a concerted solution for development. My second point is, let's look at the world today again. What is very obvious to everyone today is that there are so many types of fragmentation on the economic front, on trade, there's fragmentation. Everybody's looking to protect their own vested interests. On the climate front, the Minister of Congo has just spoken about it. When we talk about global warming, some people say, oh no, this is not how we're going to look at global warming. This is how we need to look at it because this is from our perfective. And on the technological front too, there's so many, so many types of fragmentation. So we're looking at various kinds of fragmentation. And the problem that's the most threatening one today is that the confrontation between these fragmentations threatens to threatens the peace of everybody and this is probably going to promote the law of the strongest and that will turn out to be reality if we don't do anything and so that is a main threat today and this kind of threat that we're facing today are in fact undermining all of the diplomatic solutions that we can come up with so the problems are increasingly complex and traditional diplomacy is no longer working and so all of the associated things things that are associated with diplomacy don't function either. So how do you streamline all of this financing if the problems are becoming increasingly complex? So that's why I think that this um, portrait should in fact encourage us to congratulate these two authors because the problem is in fact a very complex one. Now secondly, when you look at the rear view mirror, you realize that all of this has already existed in the past. Why is it that today things are not working as in the past? If you go back to the Marshall Plan, they haven't spoken about it because that was obvious. These were the 
first steps of modern financing aid. In less than two decades, the Marshall Plan enabled, firstly, the reconstruction of all of the countries that were affected by war, and secondly, to develop their capacity to take charge of themselves. And why was that possible? Well, because aid was homogenous in a, a sense. Aid targeted a, the problem in a very comprehensive way and came up with a solution that involved all of the aspects that uh, were affected in the country. We're talking about financing of development. And when we talk about, look at the documents published by Ferdi, 80% of uh, development finance doesn't come from aid. 80% comes from internal resources of the countries. That means aid cannot develop countries. Aid is just a complement. And the works and the summits of Busan also showed that aid is just one of the many solutions for development, not the only solution. So when you talk about aid, the main problem is that we need to figure out what the objective is. How can uh, assistance can help countries to go beyond aid, actually? And unfortunately, we, we can observe what is happening now. And as Olivier said, OECD countries were very forward thinking when it came to this question of aid. And for me, it's very important to really find the right solution now. And over the past few years, uh, countries from the global south uh, or maybe the one we say uh, that are emerging countries, well, they also started to contribute to uh, aid, to finance uh, development aid. And when we look at the paper, which is very clear on this point, the, the contribution of these countries is about 40% now to uh, development aid assistance. However, when you look at the architecture of uh, aid uh, accountability, well, you do not see those countries So what I would like to say uh, when it comes to solutions is that it's, it's not an easy topic and it's not a mundane comment that I've just made. Those countries have two objectives. First, they have political objectives. They to change the geo geopolitical game. And secondly, to also modify the uh, standard setting uh, framework of aid, of assistance. And if you do not take this into account when you actually cannot exclude 40% of donors and then say that we're moving forward uh, to a, a sort of rationalization. And actually the paper is very good because it really raises this issue. And then the third point I wanted to make is that we can see what are the different actors, what are the different countries. And, very, and if you look at African countries, where most reports tell you that 90% of uh, imports and exports of those countries go through uh, sea or road. However, when you take stock of partnerships, for example, the partnership between the EU and Africa, when first first you realize that in terms of infrastructure nothing much was done and what was done is of poor quality then secondary uh, se secondly countries remain dependent on uh, basic products uh, thirdly the agricultural policy did not lead to anything uh, good and the thing is the aid is supposed to help countries to then uh, look after themselves and so it, the diversification of aid must be looked into uh, thinking what countries need and not, not what actually people want to see. But unfortunately, 
agencies could look at the perspective of what people want, not what countries want. And so I will tell you what, what solutions I think are, would be good as well, because at the moment when we move towards fragmentation, uh, unfortunately, after the year 2000, uh, OECD countries have totally uh, given up on infrastructure uh, investment to uh, finance uh, well common goods like climate or health. But this fragmentation cannot lead uh, to uh, our countries to become more responsible and take 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 charge of themselves and, and their future in hands. And so with this extreme fragmentation, there's no more consistency, there's no more collegiality. So for example, if we speak about a special fund that finances HIV, it's a good thing, but it's a government policy. It needs to involve uh, the Minister of Finance, prefects in regions, because they are the ones who are to uh, oversee what happens on the ground. But people actually see the specialization of ministries, and this actually breaks governmental cohesion. So in our countries, fragmentation is really a danger for development. And development must be actually the, the result of a global th thought. You cannot have development if you just look with one specialist uh, eye, one specialist perspective, with, and ignoring what is done in other areas. But then there's also what you can see in the report, so fragmentation of results that we want um, that, that on the short term. We want short term results, we want immediate results. However, development does not happen in the short term. And countries that receive uh, aid are actually steered against their will to short term results. So they can't do anything that will be long term and, uh, and changing. And then the, the third thing is the loss of credibility. Because every donor uh, who comes actually loses everyone's time because we need to look at what money they spent and how all this. Look also at transparency, impacts, results. So I would say that as much as, well, for example, for populations, or for the country, there's really a problem with this fragmentation. So sorry, I think I've already reached my eight minutes or even gone beyond, so I will uh, shortly conclude and take questions if there's any, but what I would like to, I would like to come back to a proposal that was made uh, 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 which was TOSSD, was total official support for sustainable development. That was, uh, 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 a suggestion at the summit. And the idea was to create a framework in which, for example, China, India, these type of countries would also uh, take part. And we could even open up this framework. It was open up to other type of uh, stakeholders. But uh, this framework is actually not mentioned in the report. So I would like maybe uh, to have some information about how this is going forward. But I really believe that this fragmentation, uh, may, may, it's impossible to actually uh, put an end to fragmentation, but we need to have a tendency to reduce it. And the idea is really to see how we can address, uh, for example, the infrastructure problem together, even if everyone uh, contributes their own share. So to also have a global vision. Secondly, uh, when, see when seeking uh, solutions, we should take into consideration the uh, country's economic performance like we used to do after the Second World War and how to make sure that this economic performance is at the forefront of our action because whether we like it or not, that's what is the most important, is to know how the country will manage resources to sustain their own development. So that's why I really second the 
just your suggestion that you made earlier because to, today we don't really see any real solution but we see some 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 leads some possibilities and we see also some aims that we, we try to make sure everyone agrees with them for example address the infrastructure question and the performance question to see the performance of countries I know it's also important to mobilize resources, to uh, stress transparency, to address, to stress accountability. It's the whole package, basically, but, uh, and how we can then also bring together more stakeholders because the private sector must also take part in the process of, of development financing. And then another aspect of your report that we need to probably strengthen is the regional framework especially when looking for solutions, we need to really uh, give more importance to regional frameworks. You can't improve countries' efficiency if you do not actually address regional issues or issues at the regional level. So we really need to take uh, into account what happens at the regional level and see what can be done so that countries be uh, to, to be more uh, to have a better performance economic performance and then open the discussion to other actors as well so they can take part thank you well thank you for uh, your conclusions which uh, really stress this idea of a regional coordination like uh, was said as was said by Arlette Soudan Nono and also the necessity to coordinate uh, funding at this level. Uh, the geographical aspect is always important for financing. And actually here, I remember that uh, when Tertius Zonger was the uh, Ministry for Economy and Finance in Burkina Faso, well, he actually demanded uh, donors to actually coordinate their action at the local level, not just centrally, but also locally. And actually, that shows that really uh, countries are also partly responsible to fight against this uh, fragmentation and to look up to, to, to improve coordination. So I believe now that our representative of the Treasury uh, has very little time left. So if you want to take the floor now, before I give the floor back to Serge de Gallet or Olivier Cataneo, uh, except if you can stay longer with us. Um, okay, so we will be moving the camera. Well, thank you for giving me the floor. Welcome uh, everyone to Bercy and to the Ministry of Finance. I hope you're happy to be with us. We'll have a, a short uh, coffee break uh, after this uh, uh, debate. I would also like to thank everyone for your essential contributions that are very welcome, that will really help prepare the summit in June for a government that's already uh, organized several international uh, summits, very prestigious one from 2017 uh, onwards. And I believe the June summit will have an even stronger ambition and all collective efforts to, uh, in the lead of those summits are welcome. No, now, when I was explaining the different areas we will be uh, covering today, well, I was very excited because diversi the diversification of uh, international financing is really uh, the story of my life for at least the past two years. So I was the French delegate at the uh, executive board of the Green uh, Climate Fund. I was also part of the negotiation team in the uh, COP meeting. And so I'm really aware of this fragmentation and also political uh, pressures which leads to even more uh, fragmentations. It's really something that I have experienced myself firsthand. So I wanted to uh, give a testimony in a way of, of what I've experienced, but 
in all humility, because I'm not an expert as Alain Leroy or the Jean-Michel Severino. However, so I can't give you an expert point of view, but I can share a few anecdotes um, with you. So first, I would say there, was, there, was, there are many objective reasons to this multiplication or fragmentation. Uh, for example, uh, new donors, also new uh, er global areas that are emerging, and we need to embrace those new evolutions. But there's a sort of boomerang effect that they make us look at the um, Bretton Wood institutions, and it's actually something we'll try to speak about in, in this June summit, is really how we can re uh, we can reuse those Bretton Woods institution uh, to update them and deal with current uh, topics today and current preoccupations. Also, this fragmentation is due not only to donors, but also to uh, beneficiaries. I mean, obviously, there's new emerging donors and also donors of their own preferences, different subject areas that, that they prefer working on or financing. Uh, and uh, this is why we have uh, this prolif proliferation of, uh, of, of agencies and donors. Also because I'm in charge of climate and environment. I uh, also could observe uh, that there's been a nationalization of international financing. So now when you speak about climate funds or green funds, th th all those um, Subjects are being debated during COP meetings, which are organized by the UN. And here, the EU, which represented 80% of uh, financial of, of wealth financing, was actually work, talking with only one voice. So it was one voice for 80%. So this really at least skewed uh, the conversation and then the negotiations and the results. And then also on the side of donors, we also have to accept some accountability and because it's always very difficult for us to agree on uh, closing down a fund that has gone beyond its uh, expected, expected life cycle. And it's the case, for example, of climate investment funds, which had a sunset clause, which was actually never applied and they should have been they should have been closed when we op when we created a green uh, climate fund, and it's actually never been the case. They've never been uh, the Santa Claus was never applied. Then I would say that when it comes to the specializations of those funds, well, this, there's a limit to this hyper specialization, as we can see today. Now, for example, there's 12 funds uh, in the World Bank for uh, climate, and they spend about four billion in total when compared to 20 billion or 40 billion to uh, the World Bank in, in total. So we can see the difference between specialization and mainstreaming of funding. Uh, the political attention is not always where it should be because what is most important is mainstreaming, is big development banks. And it's not by creating even more specialized, interestingly specialized instruments that will actually uh, do a difference when it comes to global financing. And actually the priority demand of receiving countries, like it was repeated again in Montreal, is, is, is mainstream financing. For example, if in Montreal we replenished the uh, global uh, environment and funds, the global environment facility, and yet we had to create a new facility for, for the environment. But the, create, the setting up of new funds, of new vehicles, does not actually lead to a, a growth in financing. And then there's an increasing uh, competitivity, competition between the funds, which is perceived also by uh, beneficiaries. Although there's some effort that are being made at the moment to actually increase coordination between the different stakeholders, whether on the ground or at the political level. And an example here is uh, 
the Global Environment Facility or the Green Climate Fund, or CIFs who's, who have a financing model that is dedicated, so it's dedicated model of financing, and then they delegate the conception of projects to multilateral agencies or bilateral agencies on the ground. And this actually multiplies co-financing, multiplies cooperation, but it has a strong drawback is that no one really takes responsibility. There's the, the responsibility is totally fragmenting throughout this chain. And this also makes things more opaque uh, from one end to the other of the chain. So a final point on the uh, avenue for improvement. As a practitioner, I'm going to be very humble, but I'd just like to recall some of uh, the uh, actions that uh, are already undertaken by the uh, Treasury Directorate here at uh, the uh, Finance Ministry. First of all, what we can do in terms of um, harmonizing uh, impact assessment and uh, flow measurements. Uh, for climate financing, a lot has already been done in that particular area. area. We've got the OECD and the Multilateral Bank Annual Report. Uh, We've got the multilateral banks that have the same uh, metrics and the same tools, but there are still some uh, gaps when it comes to assessing result, especially with the uh, Green Climate Fund, which is uh, just about 10 years old. Uh, the uh, result uh, framework is uh, very uh, ambitious and was approved in 2021, and that was one of the priorities of the French presidency. And then there's uh, biodiversity uh, financing. The uh, Montreal Agreement asks us to go from 10 to 25 billion and then to, uh, to 30 billion. Um, well, in terms of uh, measuring these flows, we're neither here nor there. There's a lot of uh, work uh, to be uh, done. And the Rio markers and the methodology is not used by all the uh, multilateral banks. And the expectations are very high on multilateral players. Multilateral uh, players in the area of biodiversity are slightly lagging behind the bilateral donors. What we've also been working on over the last uh, few years is the coordination of uh, different uh, agencies uh, between them. For example, the uh, strategic partnership uh, partnership between uh, the uh, Green Fund and the interpreter apologized, but we did not hear get to hear what was just been said because there's uh, sound is breaking up um, in the room. Other avenue that uh, is uh, outlined is the uh, JetP, so the bottom up contract based uh, approach. Uh, with a partner country by partner country approach, with all of uh, the uh, limits, of course, that uh, flow from that is very much uh, an experiment and it relies on the uh, preferences of uh, the uh, countries uh, involved. So we're going to complete the third JetP uh, with uh, South Africa, or rather has been completed at COP26. Let's see if it can be replicated. And our final thing that we work on uh, uh, day in, day out is to improve the efficiency of each of uh, these uh, funds. So we look at the boards and we look at how they can run things more efficiently. Because if we're creating uh, more specialized funds, it's to answer the uh, demand of uh, partner countries who want greater access, greater uh, efficiency. And so, it's by reworking and overhauling to some extent the existing fund that we can contain fragmentation going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, this uh, very useful reminder. I'd just like to go back to uh, one of the issues that uh, you raised and that's uh, probably not in the report because we couldn't uh, we couldn't include it in there. But uh, let's talk about intra-European fragmentation. 
we have an issue uh, there. Uh, is the EU a single bloc or uh, is it a kind of a jigsaw? I think that's an important question. Other interesting issue that you raised was uh, the result framework that uh, most institutions have. But the uh, problem is how do we compare institutions uh, between uh, one another? So, you know, institutions need to have the same uh, methodology. We still need to hear from four speakers. Um, we are going to hear from a former player of uh, of uh, funds and, and uh, international development uh, financing. He was a director and ambassador in Vietnam, in Tunisia, in uh, Bangladesh. And nowadays, he uh, works in the area of philanthropy as a uh, as the director of Tunis et Développement Foundation. Over to you, Serge. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to try and be a briefer than our previous uh, speakers. I'd just like to go back to the excellent report drafted by Jean-Michel and uh, Alain. And I'd like to raise three questions. First of all, we want to integrate some of the elements that are in the uh, document, but they're not all there actually, because Alain's uh, and uh, Jean-Michel's uh, 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 summary uh, note is, is uh, shorter and we all know why. So we said it's important to streamline uh, ODA. Now, ODA is just a part of uh, the uh, financial flows that go to uh, countries in the South. And increasingly, it's a smaller and smaller share of uh, flows that go to uh, South uh, countries. First of all, because there is more private funding than uh, previously, about a, a third of uh, the uh, flows. Um, there's also the uh, rise of uh, China. China weighs some 65 billion US uh, dollars when it comes to uh, flows that uh, are earmarked to Africa and to Africa alone. Uh, China uh, is therefore taking uh, more and more space in Africa. And when it comes to ODA more specifically, it's also quite obvious to see that uh, urgency prevails over development. So urgency, what do I mean by that? Refugees, for example, uh, that were multiplied two or threefold over the last few years, uh, food assistance, health, and uh, the OECD currently calculates 45% of uh, ODA that is not urgent. So, as you can see, the, uh, the sums and uh, the uh, scope of the flows are significant, but they need to be put into perspective. You need to look at the uh, bigger picture of all of uh, the flows. I think that's the first thing that's important to, uh, to note. Secondly, secondly, what is the important, and, and it's actually stated in uh, the uh, report, is that we need to uh, use the demand as a starting point. Patrick, every time I uh, see him, I feel a little bit uh, younger because uh, he uh, reminded me that I started out in Cameroon some 50 years ago and with my ambassador I uh, inaugurated a uh, road there, the uh, Yaoundé, Yaoundé uh, train line as well that went all the way to Gaoura, the uh, Douala harbour, the Kibi uh, harbour. I'm not sure that uh, a young man now who uh, starts out his career at the embassy in Cameroon 
will have the opportunity to uh, see the uh, country uh, grow so rapidly simply because um, things have changed. The first thing that comes to mind is uh, something that was said in 1963 under the Yaoundé Agreement. And the agreement states, hold on, let me find it in my uh, notes. So that's in the uh, preamble. The Cameroon and its African partners are going to pursue their efforts for the economic, social, and cultural development of their country. That was some 60 years ago now. Two years ago, in the uh, preamble of the European instrument, the uh, neighboring and uh, development cooperation and international cooperation instrument, uh, the Article 1 uh, reads the uh, main objective of the neighboring instrument is to promote the uh, values, the principles, and uh, uh, fundamental interests across the world. There's not a single reference made to development, and there's no reference made to the interests of Africa more specifically. And actually, when you read the uh, report from Ms. von der Leyen uh, on uh, December the 11th with the Global Gateway, uh, there's a single paragraph, just the one, on why uh, this uh, program exists. Global Gateway is first and foremost a geopolitical uh, program that aims at positioning Europe in a competitive international market. It is a crucial tool because investing in infrastructure lies at the heart of current geopolitics. Once again, no mention is made of developments. We're talking about geopolitics. We're building roads in Africa because China is doing the same. We're building harbors in Africa because China is doing that. We're not doing it for Africans. We're not doing it for Africa. Although that might be the end result, it's not the starting point. So inevitably, uh, today, and my, my friend Gordo Montaigne, former uh, Secretary General, just actually published a, a book, uh, the title of which others don't think like us. So not everybody thinks like us. Uh, in Europe, we uh, are kind of losing touch with uh, this uh, demand from Africa. And that uh, hampers our ability to uh, execute a development policy. Now, I'd like to read something from Leopold Sédar, who's uh, not an anti-West uh, 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 person at all. He was a member of the French uh, uh, Letters and Arts Academy. He was married to a French lady. And 30 years ago, he said, what uh, distinguished people want, be they from the West or from uh, any other uh, part of the world, is to impose on us a European civilization and to uh, bring us exotic uh, people into uh, the fold of a kind of universal uh, vision where we'd be, we would become consumers of a universal civilization. So I think that here again, there is a great opportunity to improve the uh, relationship. We need to share the same objectives, the same aims, and also the uh, same uh, the same processes. Now, I don't want to paint too dark a picture, I mean, far from it, actually. Um, but I'd like to wrap up this, uh, this uh, speech on the, uh, the way forward. Now, I believe, and in that I'm going to echo what uh, Kers just said earlier, I believe that uh, there's a lot we can do in terms of uh, streamlining, and uh, we will be more efficient at streamlining if we look at the whole picture. Now, of course, this is uh, very easy to say, but much more complicated to do because there's also private uh, financing. But when it comes to uh, China, more specifically, uh, China 
makes up a huge part of uh, the uh, aid to uh, Africa, more than the uh, Paris Club. Uh, China is uh, pursuing their own interests, which clash with our own. But nonetheless, there is an expectation from Africa to uh, see a level of cooperation between the West and uh, China, India, and Singapore. France has tried to uh, bring about such a uh, cooperation when uh, Mr. Chang and Mr. Valls signed an agreement, but uh, nothing uh, came from it. There was a, a meeting in uh, Dakar, but that was about it. There are projects that uh, exists that exist uh, where uh, Western and Chinese uh, uh, players uh, come together, and this is the kind of effort that needs to, uh, well, first of all, succeed and then be promoted. I think that if we want to improve the architecture, we need greater cooperation between China and uh, the West and Western China, of course. Second recommendation uh, from me is that we need to uh, listen more carefully to uh, the priorities of uh, countries in the South. Of course, there's the role of women. Of course, there's the issue of uh, homosexuality, of uh, uh, hunger, etc. These are important issues. But for a farmer in uh, Sahel who's dying of hunger, these topics are not very important. Uh, Jacques Chirac actually said this uh, many years uh, before me. So I'm just uh, parroting what our former president once said. But it's true, you know, um, agriculture is a very important uh, uh, part of uh, ODA. If you look at ODA flows to Africa, actually, uh, agriculture makes up nearly $2 billion, i.e. 6% of flows. And I'm going to interrupt you. This is why we're going to have a special session on uh, agriculture financing in May. And if you mix everything together, you have 8% of flows for agriculture. And yet, agriculture is one of the very top priorities for Africa, or should be in any case for them and for us uh, as well. So, we mentioned infrastructure earlier. I remember when we could travel from Yaoundé to Gaoundé in first class, uh, which means also uh, more jobs and, and a greater and a bigger job market. But look, there are priorities and uh, you also need to understand that uh, other people's priorities need to be acceptable. Thirdly, third and final comment, and then I'll wrap up. Okay, I'll wrap up uh, quickly just uh, to uh, echo what Perseus said earlier. I fully agree, uh, naturally, that we need to have a forum for discussion, but we need also to take action on the ground. And the ground is essentially countries, regions, and projects being deployed there, programs being deployed there, programs and projects on which uh, we uh, work on in uh, good faith between uh, decision makers, practitioners of uh, development. And uh, this is where streamlining can really be brought about. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much uh, for sharing uh, with us uh, your uh, perspective. Um, I'm not going to make any uh, comment uh, right now, uh, but since uh, we're talking about uh, countries and, and regions, I'd like to talk about uh, the uh, south of Madagascar and uh, uh, Mr. Sanogo, uh, who is the coordinator of international uh, actions undertaken in uh, his uh, country. So his role is to be a UN coordinator. Uh, Issa, uh, can you hear us uh, properly? Yes, good evening. Well, thank you uh, very much uh, for sitting tight. I see that the internet is working quite well in the south of Madagascar. The infrastructure is doing well. Well, infrastructures are, are quite good, but uh, the uh, Prime Minister earlier mentioned the uh, issue of, uh, of uh, safety and uh, security. So I'm going to be uh, brief. Uh, 
because I need to get to somewhere where um, uh, security is a bit uh, higher. So what I'd like to talk about is uh, common funds that Alain mentioned uh, in, uh, in their document. And I'd like to uh, look at uh, the message from the UN Secretary General who in 2019 uh, said that uh, we were or rather the uh, development objectives were interconnected and uh, meant that we needed to have more um, more predictable uh, financing. And I think that uh, that uh, speaks to some of the comments that have been made uh, so far. A uh, common fund uh, leads to better cooperation and coordination between the different uh, entities, be they from the ministry, or be they from uh, the uh, UN. Now, what I'd like to uh, to uh, say is the same as our Prime Minister Tertius and say that uh, fragmentation and uh, diversification is uh, a uh, hindrance to financing uh, ODDs. I'm not going to go into the reasons uh, why, because Alain and uh, Jean-Michel's uh, document uh, outline this uh, really well. But I'd just like to say that uh, two years ago, I started working on this idea of a local common fund to try and better integrate the UN action since I am the resident UN coordinator. France systematically came back to me and said, the idea and the premise uh, was a good one, but that they weren't ready to change their approach. I'm not going to go into the details because there are lots of details uh, to go over if I have to explain the reasons behind this posture. This posture, uh, in fact, reinforces the uh, problem of, of fragmentation of uh, public financing. Now, what are the opportunities to streamline ODA? Well, I think we need to widen the paradigm. And once again, I think uh, the speakers before me have uh, pointed to one specific uh, aspect, Serge and Tertius in fact spoke about it at length, i.e. the need to look at the link between national finance, uh, public financing and international financing. And when you look at LDC5 and endogenous uh, financing accounts for a lot and this link is needs to be enhanced because the comprehensive system is so bleak that mobilizing additional resources becomes extremely challenging and interest rates for developing countries are really high because of the risks associated with these kinds of financing. But I think the elephant in the room is the question of endogenous financing of a development. So let me give you one example. In Madagascar, just in the one particular field, we lose billions of uh, dollars when it comes to the gold sector, just for gold. So imagine if uh, we could streamline this sector and if we could find a link with international financing, how much we could save. I think there's also a question to be asked as to the optimal fragmentation of financing or rather optimal consolidation of financing. I think we need to move from economic policy to political economy. Let me explain what I mean by that. 
the multilateral financing perhaps can be looked at from a perspective rather than a perspective of pro-poor financing as a pro-development financing. So for me, it's all about improving efficiency and better steering resources towards nexus that can accelerate the SDGs. I'll give you another few examples. The nexus, uh, energy, water, and climate in a country such as Madagascar is extremely important for development. So you need to integrate that. And then there's the nexus, health digitalization, and education and competencies of uh, the youth and uh, women. Food systems and nutrition, another nexus. So, and obviously the humanitarian situation today requires a scaling up of the humanitarian response. But if you want to go back to development, you need uh, a nexus that takes into account um, nutrition and sis food systems. And then hu humanitarian, human rights, and peace is another ex nexus that you need to consider. So what I mean by all of this is that you need to work towards a consolidation that will lead to further impact rather than remain in at the stage of optimal fragmentation. To conclude, I would say we need to better align the financing frameworks with the, the needs of financing SDGs with a systematic, with a systemic and a more integrated approach that is also more coordinated with more focus on accelerators of SDGs. Wanting to finance individual activities or sectors will not, I think, have an impact, a real impact, especially in countries such as Madagascar. So this is a call, again, for further integration. And one last aspect I'd like to touch upon is to accept taking risks in the field of ODA, including in the context where there is such high vulnerability to shocks that every time there is an ODA and there is such a shock, well, there's a sort of step back. And so these investments, investments must take into account the question of prevention and also the question of reduction of uh, disaster risks and look at these issues uh, in a long-term perspective. So these were the few thoughts uh, from the field that I wanted to bring back to this discussion with regard to the paper drafted by Alain and Jean-Michel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Issa, for this uh, perspective from the south of Madagascar, where you're on a mission currently, if I understood rightly. So we're going to go back now to some central issues with the, uh, the OECD, Olivier Cataneo, with a slightly more technical presentation on the question. So I'd urge you to stay concise like your uh, previous, uh, uh, like the previous speakers. Is Mr. Issa Sanogo still with us? Can you still hear us in Madagascar? Yes, I'm still here, says Isa. I have about 10 minutes before which I ha after which I have to leave. Yes, I was ambassador to Madagascar about 10, 15 years ago. And I had tried to set up a country platform. I think it no longer exists. The country is not very vast, and there are few actors and so we managed to establish a country platform and this seemed like a natural solution there was the ball bank the U U european union the giz etc and it was working pretty well but this was 15 years ago and the fact that you didn't mention it i believe i'm led to believe that uh, this no longer exists uh, uh, 
Is there such a platform still that allows for a real coordination between the various actors? When it comes to international partners, there is a certain amount of coordination, but the link between the government and these actors is um, uh, leaves much to be hoped for. And I think that is the crux of the problem. The ownership and the leadership from the government is a challenging issue. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your clear response. Uh, Olivier. Olivier, over to you. Thank you. I'm also going to try and be very quickly. I do not have a minister's council. I don't have a curfew, but I do have to go pick up my daughter from school. So uh, I have some obligations too. Thank you very much for all of these presentations uh, and for the paper uh, that uh, brought up uh, many issues that are very relevant, uh, talking about country platforms. Well, sadly, there's also a lack of coordination between various country platforms that exist. Uh, there's the country platform that is established that was established by the UNDP, by the World Bank, etc. So there's a question of legitimacy when it comes to deciding which country platform is the most relevant. So just one p little comment on that issue. So yes, I've been following uh, um, the presentations on the paper, and so I'm not going to. Um, dwell on the diagnosis, but let me present to you four graphs that can sometimes uh, perhaps, well, the graph can probably tell you more than uh, what I would be able to tell you. Let me just try and pull the presentation up on screen. Could the slides be uh, shown on screen, please? Thank you very much. So this is the evolution of the multilateral system since the Second World War. And uh, we're at the figure that was uh, presented earlier. So just for development uh, uh, in the CRS database of uh, DAC, uh, this is, these are the figures. You have the various waves also that you'll uh, see, the Bretton Woods uh, institutions, the decolonization period that was accompanied by the various regional banks that emerged, and also the specialized agencies of the UN. And then uh, the following years, you'll see the emergence of vertical funds that uh, responded to the global common uh, public goods. And then lastly, uh, the um, uh, issue that's risen with the fragmentation because of geopolitical um, uh, issues. Uh, so there's uh, AIIB, and there's also the great global gateway of the uh, European Union, and the US also that created its own system. And so everybody basically wants to create their own system and uh, allocate uh, money from these systems. And so you'll see here on this vertical uh, axe, uh, and also the trust funds. So there's an increasing amount of money in the multilateral system, but there's also an increasing amount of money in trust funds. So basically, you're looking at a la carte system. And uh, in this case, it's always difficult to come back to a common vision that we were talking about earlier. My third point that I wanted to show you through this graph, this was also mentioned by Stefan earlier, there's a huge fragmentation, about a dozen organizations that represent more than 70% of uh, the financing. And then you have all of these small bubbles that uh, you see on the right of this graph with all of these various funds, and you wonder whether they're going to be really efficient. And then, as was said by Stefan, um, the argument is that it's easier to uh, raise funds when the new fund is created, that's true, but on the right here you'll see that these new funds uh, do depend on the previous uh, existing system of the UN or other systems to deliver their actions and objectives on their objectives. So basically they're also um, harnessing the resources that have already existed in the previous system. So basically this becomes a sort of cumbersome system to manage. and. Now, when it comes to increasing transparency and consistency, let me just uh, 
uh, insist on the point of governance uh, and and uh, then talk about uh, a few avenues that we can explore to improve the situation. Now, firstly, I'd like to respond to your question. Yes, there has been uh, an effort made to modernize uh, TOSSD, Total Official Support for Sustainable Development, and um, um, this takes into account uh, private financing, uh, all of the South-South flows, and uh, triangular cooperation flows as well. So basically, this involves 20 countries that are not members of DAC, including Brazil, Indonesia, among others. And so in our database, we do manage to also capture the private sector. And then there's the philanthropy sector, which also reports uh, to the OECD now. We have the Gates Foundation and other foundations. We also have the sovereign funds. Um, and we are also capable now of integrating um, the global public uh, goods dimension as well in our CRS uh, database. And a TOSD is now going to become an international independent task force uh, and become completely autonomous. And another suggestion of the paper, well, I don't really like the term mega DAC. When DAC was created in the 1960s, the members represented uh, the totality of all of uh, the aid. Uh, but today, this is not so much the case. There is now a fragmentation that we're talking about, and there are lots of emerging donors. And so when DAC was created, there was uh, the intention of getting common statistics. Uh, there was also the intention of conducting peer review. And there was also the dimension that was spoken about, i.e., um, establish uh, norms and good practices. Today, that's not so much the case. So we're basically, we've been divested of uh, those missions. And obviously, this is problematic. Here at the Ministry of Finance, we can talk about it. Uh, for instance, uh, aid linked to our members at DAC so, yes, for members of DAC, there are some rules that don't uh, necessarily apply to non-members of DAC. So, yes, that is a problem. And obviously, I'm interested in discussing about uh, these questions of transparency and coherence with Ferdi, with other institutions. And uh, so we've conducted studies uh, to trace the similarities between the portfolios of AIDS uh, among various actors. And these are graphs that are quite simple. And so here you have a geographical similarity and thematic uh, similarities here. And we also look at similarity between instruments, which isn't shown here. And if you look at all of the different portfolio, here on this first slide, you can see, uh, you can understand the strategies of bilaterals when they use multilaterals. And on the left, you see that f vertical funds well, they use it because there's a very low similarity when it comes to theme. And so basically, this means that when there's a new theme, they're going to create a new fund. And then France, for instance, will continue to act in the same geography through multilateral aid. But we'll look at other uh, geographies while trying to expand its bilateral aid. And some countries use trust funds to do the same things as they do in the framework of multi, uh, multilateral aids. But other countries, on the other hand, will continue to act in the same country, but in different thematics. And this is the square that you see uh, on the left, uh, on the top. This is the case for Japan or for France, for instance. This tool uh, that analyzes 
uh, the aid portfolio also enables us to promote cooperation between actors. Here, for instance, I've looked at uh, the portfolio of uh, AFD, the Agence Française de Développement, uh, that I've compared with that of uh, the other uh, DFIs. And we've looked at where they come uh, intervene in the same geographies. And so this graph, for instance, once we know the portfolios of other agencies and other multilateral agencies to know who is doing what and where, well, this enables us to work better together. So that's a very quick presentation on what I had to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we've reached the conclusion of uh, the report when it comes to coordination and the establishment of uh, common rules of reporting uh, for all of the actors. But I think it's, uh, before opening up the floor for discussion, uh, let me just go back to the author <laughs> uh, of the paper, the uh, and also give the floor to Bernard Rensberg, uh, thank you for being with us. Sorry to keep you waiting. Maybe we should have started with you because you have actually uh, all the data on the subject. So what are your uh, feedback on this debate and also about the vertical fund that you know very well? Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to your event. I will speak English if you do not mind because it's easier for me. Uh, first of all, I'd, I'd like to congratulate the authors to a really concise report. Uh, it really is very well balanced and, and raises uh, very important points uh, that also overlap with a lot of what we have found in our research. And what I'm going to talk about in the next five minutes will be, well, first talking a little bit more about the diagnosis. So how, how accurate is the diagnosis? Second, should we be concerned about fragmentation? And third, I will comment on the proposed cures on fragmentation. So in terms of how accurate the diagnosis is, I, I would like to play a little bit the devil's advocate here and, and ask whether the proliferation of eight donors and eight channels, which is indeed a reality as we have seen both in the paper and also now from the OECD's intervention uh, is, is a reality, but, but there is potentially a, an alternative interpretation of, of these patterns. One is that we have now many more donors than a while ago. So, and all these donors now also report to the OECD DAC databases, right? So this is, a, this is a consequence of calls for greater transparency. And no wonder that we now sort of see in the data uh, more fragmentation, what uh, potentially has already been there, but has now made been more visible through these transparency initiatives. And the second point, which has already come up in the debate, is that we have much more aid in the system. Um, of course, the climate funds are an important uh, dimension to this with the 100 billion commitment. And so as, as a natural consequence, we would, we would need to see more institutions through which this aid is being channeled. Um, so that basically to, uh, to yeah, stimulate some thinking about what we would expect actually in terms of this fragmentation to, to look like in a, in a system where we have much more foreign aid than in the past. Now, of course, I very much agree with the core diagnosis of the report, which is that the system is too fragmented. So I very much agree with the idea to look for a sweet spot in terms of an optimal level of fragmentation and to start singling out and remedying uh, particularly questionable practices, which in my opinion, include first uh, the proliferation of climate funds. So um, the deputy uh, to the GCF has already mentioned earlier that the climate investments fund, funds, for instance, had a sunset clause but the CIF board decided to indefinitely postpone it in June, 2019. So uh, whether this might be for political reasons or for if there was a real need, um, of course would, would, would need to be uh, investigated further, but this essentially shows that um, it's very difficult to close down trust funds once they have been established, even large ones, or especially the large ones actually. 
And uh, second problematic is the so-called double delegation phenomenon or now triple or multiple delegation. Um, so funds are being passed through multiple entities before reaching the implementing partners. Um, and this we can see even in the case of national donor administrations. So for example, I'm very familiar with the German case where you have the Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation, which uh, then instructs the KFW Development Bank to uh, hand over finances to say the UN Democracy Fund. And then this fund decides to implement with uh, the UNDP or, or another UN operative agency. Um, and of course, um, I have easily uh, enlisted now four uh, institutions through, through which this uh, money has, has gone. And everybody sort of takes a cut. And in some sense, uh, there's overheads and administrative costs. So you can already see that uh, this does not look like a very efficient system. So is there a chance to reduce this uh, double delegation and essentially include increase the accountability in the aid system. So that must be a priority moving forward. Should we be concerned about fragmentation? Um, well, I would say there is a trade-off here between economic efficiency and political efficiency. So as the paper rightly summarizes, there is growing evidence that fragmentation is economically inefficient. And I will also provide you some additional evidence today that this is the case. But I want, want to already warn against the early or premature conclusion uh, that one should uh, tackle this, this fragmentation because it appears to be politically efficient and steps to reduce fragmentation may ultimately backfire. So I work uh, a lot on the questions of effectiveness of earmarked funding. Now, all of you are familiar with this uh, with this phenomenon, so from a world that looked like uh, the left-hand graph here of a single collective funding relationship, we are now in a world of multiple complex funding relationships where donors contract in, with individual implementing organizations, but also route money through these global implementing or global intermediary funds like the GEF or the Global Fund. And uh, this, these flows, uh, of or earmarked funding has massively increased over the 20 years, uh, which, which has uh, led to concerns about distorted funding priorities, uh, increased rejection costs, and ultimately a loss of legitimacy of the multilateral system. Now, in my research project that, that is funded through the UK Research and Innovation, um, I basically tried to understand what are the economic effects of uh, this rise in earmarked funding. And we collected various data sources and run several analyses that all point to a single conclusion so far, namely that earmarked funding allows international organizations to do more, but they do it less well, right? So if we look at the organizational level, we can analyze these performance ratings that were made available, for instance, by MOPAN, um, which is uh, housed in the OECD as well. And we have uh, made use or we have unlocked this great wealth of data um, and essentially find that um, organizations that, that rely a lot on earmarked funding um, have less efficient processes as a result. But there is no effect on the actual achievement of results uh, for these organizations. So any funding in some sense is good in terms of achieving an organization's mandate. We also have looked at the project level where we find uh, project ratings of earmarked funds to be slightly worse than for core funded projects. And last but not least, we also have looked at subnational outcomes, um, namely economic growth at the local level, as well as human development outcomes. And here we also found uh, that earmarked funds are less effective ultimately for development outcomes than core funded projects. Now, uh, while the economic uh, perspective is quite clear on the effectiveness of, of these earmarked funds, um, there, this might not be so clear for the political efficiency. Um, and evidence of that is essentially the limited progress, uh, for example, in the UN funding compact 
on reducing the proliferation of these earmarked funding modalities, despite repeated commitments of donors to, to do so. And there are simple reasons for that, some of them also already mentioned in the report and in your interventions today. Um, earmarked funds are politically attractive for donors because they enhance the visibility for donor priorities, they provide accountability for funding, and they allow donors to ultimately uphold domestic support for aid because uh, they can actually demonstrate this value for money better to domestic uh, audiences. Now, on the flip side, we also can see that this fragmentation is attractive for recipients, at least in some circumstances, namely that more choice implies more bargaining power. So recipients like to negotiate with, uh, or like to have more options essentially, uh, especially when it comes to aid, uh, when it's tied to conditions. Um, also in some sectors, greater diversity could be a source of innovation and could be beneficial. So here the example of democracy aid is a case in point where studies have shown that the more donors are active uh, in a country, the more, uh, yeah, the more effective their democracy aid is and the more the country is able to democratize. So let me finally conclude by uh, commenting on the excellent suggestions that the report lays out for how to move forward based on the problem of fragmentation and proliferation. So I, I very much support the idea for a scientific body on the global aid architecture, which would remedy the rather politicized fora that we see uh, today, like in the Development Corporation Forum or the GPEDC. Um, so we really must come to, a, come to a situation where we have an evidence-informed architecture. And uh, we already see some fragmented initiatives around that. So one example here would be this uh, study on climate change trust funds um, that I conducted um, um, on behalf of the BMZ and, and the GIZ uh, a couple of years ago, where we mapped out the existing climate funds and made proposals for a rationalization of these funds. And that was taken up by the German government and put forward in the relevant governance uh, forums. Um, also, a very important um, yeah, strategy is to promote transparency on funds. Again, this is something that, that uh, the, the paper proposes. Um, that's obviously a very important first step in order to yeah, come to any rationalization or to coordinate and ultimately um, these different procedures so that from a perspective of recipients, it becomes easier to, to access much needed funding for development um, if they follow sort of a very similar template rather than um, you know, requiring these countries to make tailored applications uh, for development funding. So with that, uh, I, I, I wanna close and, and look forward to our discussions. Yes. Merci beaucoup de ce remarquable présentation qui Thank nous met for your very interesting presentation. à l'écoute des derniers résultats de la recherche sur le sur le sujet. Uh, je voudrais simplement noter deux points. Which really gives us the latest uh, results on this uh, subject. I would like to really come back on two main points of your presentation that are actually linked to the report. First, you are stressing again this very difficult concept of optimal uh, fragmentation and showing like the the benefits and drawbacks and how it could be balanced and also you invite us to compare vertical funds earmarked funds uh, multi-bilateral funds um, to compare them with the results that they give and it's actually something that was sort of touched upon in the report well, the report really tried to see the steering of those different funds when compared to the uh, country vulnerability to climate change. And I think actually vulnerability is a very important uh, allocation criterion to judge whether a fund really uh, is, is aligned on its own objectives.
So I'm sorry, I wasn't a very good facilitator. I left all uh, speakers speak maybe a bit too long, but they said very interesting things. So now we're going to mark a short pause, but I wouldn't like our public to be frustrated. I think there are some questions that come uh, from uh, people online. But if also there's people who actually want to take the floor uh, here in the room, because we're lucky to have people present here with us. So if some of you in the room want to raise their hand. Oh, I will give the floor to, to the facilitator. Just a few uh, quick comments uh, about what has been said. First, I'm very happy to see the number of panelists. They all came, they all said some very interesting things. And I'm very also shocked and surprised to see that everyone has read the note, which is a very good news. So if I come back on the very uh, different points that have been raised, for example, what the OECD has done through uh, the TOSID is uh, very uh, valuable. Our, note, our document was about uh, the fragmentation of uh, public financing of development, and that's really uh, our subject, public financing, although we know that there's much, uh, the flows are much uh, wider. Secondly, uh, the link between climate and development, which would be one of the main themes of our summit on the 23rd of June. Uh, and, um, it's, it's a very well uh, known uh, subject, also how we can look into vulnerable countries, etc. We all know about it, so I won't come back on to this. Then I really liked what was said. Uh, what has just been said, like fragmentation allows to do more, but not less, but less well, which which was good. And I would like to come back now on country, country platforms as well. It, it can really work when governments do what they should do, which was the case in Madagascar 15 years ago. And there's another case now, Rwanda, with the development partner coordination of Rwanda. So you can see here the government is really uh, trying to coordinate all donors to really leverage more influence on them, to wield more influence on them. So, and it actually, literature is showing that it works. So to me, the country platforms seem to be quite a valuable approach. There's also uh, investment on, on the specific energy uh, sectors, for example, the energy, then the global gateway, uh, I will defend it because I'm a European. So Ms. van der Leyen said that it's really our answer to uh, this the new Silk Road, but it's also responds to the need of infrastructure. And the Global Great West finances 150 billion infrastructure by 2027, which really responds to African needs. Uh, obviously, there's also geopolitical issues beyond this, but first and foremost, it responds to existing needs in Africa. And actually, uh, you see the Marshall Plan uh, work. There was only one donor. It was homogeneous. It was interesting to, to come back to this idea. Then when it comes to agriculture, uh, I just want to remind what was said during the summit between the EU and Africa. There's enough arable surface or arable area in our this in the DCR to uh, feed the whole of Africa if this area was fully cultivated. Then about the global south priorities like climate, for example, we've received the Bill Gates who said that climate is uh, is a priority, but also uh, feeding. Uh, uh, population and fighting poverty is also a priority. We should do all this together because if not, you do climate adaptation, but people uh, die of hunger because you don't work on on, on, on food. And to quickly conclude, I can see that our approach has not been fully validated, but it's important to continue uh, in this approach. Maybe we need to create a MEGA CAD or something else. I'm not sure what the OECD will do, but this idea of having a scientific analysis was mostly validated by our different speakers.
So then it's up to them uh, to see what they do with band matching, comparability, uh, accountability, all those issues. And I believe the conversation can continue, can go on with the OECD and other stakeholders. And maybe Jean wants to add, uh, Jean-Michel wants to add a few comments as well for concluding. Well, thank you. Well, I um, would like to thank everyone for all the comments that were made. I learned a lot today from all speakers. I would just like maybe to add one comment on one point that we haven't really raised enough in our paper. However, many speakers spoke about it today is the question of national coordination which is the ultimate frontier because coordination by beneficiary uh, governments is really the ultimate frontier to have a uh, consistent uh, aid but here there's really a basic issue because the more uh, a country the poorer a country is the less capacities it has and then the more donors are coming in and so the more difficult it becomes uh, the more difficult it becomes to coordinate the aid. So it's not India or Morocco who has problem with coordination. It's Madagascar, it's Papua New Guinea or Mongolia. Those types of countries have difficulties coordinating aid. And so saying that the, the it's in the responsibility of national governments to really create aid consistency is not that easy. It has a positive aspect because it means that it will resolve the problem. And it also encourages the international community to work and to mobilize further on a capacity building, on supporting structuration of administrations, of governments, of uh, national governments, to make sure they have more capacities to manage the system. Now, everything that can be done to uh, reduce the uh, complexity for governments is, uh, of course, very useful. Sadly, I believe that uh, this uh, kind of uh, narrative has made people more pessimistic and made myself more pessimistic, actually, because there are quite a great number of people today who have insisted on uh, the uh, factors that explain this uh, fragmentation and these factors lie on both sides donors and beneficiaries and both have a share of responsibility to bear and the reason why we have uh, uh, fragmentation today uh, can be explained in many different ways and actually the reasons for fragmentations are deep and often you know completely understandable so I'm just going to leave it um, at that and just say that I don't think that uh, we'll ever restructure the uh, system in a radical manner. I think that uh, for the foreseeable future, we will uh, continue to have to do our very best with instruments that are far from perfect. Thank you. Well, thank uh, you. Uh, thank you, Alain and uh, Jean-Michel for uh, wrapping up. Uh, we're now going to take a uh, short break and we'll resume in uh, five, ten minutes because we have a very important topic to uh, address in the next uh, few uh, minutes. So please don't uh, stray too uh, far away. There's a very quick coffee break and then we'll be back in five, ten minutes uh, at the very most in the room. See you in a bit. Okay, we're resuming, we're a little bit late, we apologize for that. Um, I understand that uh, a lot of questions have been, a lot of questions have been asked uh, online. Alain, have you got a chance to see them? No, me neither. Okay, well, look, if, um, if you can stay online, we'll take your questions at uh, the end, if we have uh, the time. Sans doute, quelle heure est-il? What's the time now? Um, I suggest that we now quickly move on and uh, give the floor to uh, Vianne Deke, who is a professor at the university and uh, scientific director for Ferdi. And he'll be introducing the paper that he co-wrote along with uh, Grégoire Gargouzi and Audrey Anne, who's here as well. 
And I think that Grégoire is online, is that right? Maybe he is. Uh, he was a minute ago, I believe. Okay, you told us that he was uh, busy up until quarter past five. So it's now pretty much quarter past five. We've waited for him for that long, but I'm sure he'll be with us. Okay, we're going to start off with uh, the uh, presentation from Professor Vianney, and then we'll uh, hear from uh, Grégoire Rota Graziosi, and then we will uh, find from the uh, comment from uh, Alice uh, Gauthier uh, from uh, I4C. Benoit is not here, is he? No? Okay, I thought Benoit would uh, maybe uh, make it. So we'll have uh, this uh, discussion. And uh, if we have uh, enough uh, uh, time to uh, take all of the questions. Vianney, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, Good afternoon. So I'm here to give a little bit of backdrop to uh, the uh, document that uh, has uh, been uh, prepared. I work with Audrey, with uh, Grégoire, and with all the people who pretty much drafted this uh, document. And so uh, the idea of uh, this uh, document is to uh, support vulnerable countries by uh, taxing jet fuel. Today, uh, no tax at all is uh, levied. There's a tax exemption, uh, a tax exemption, sorry, on uh, jet fuel for a uh, dubious purpose of double uh, taxation that dates back to Nero, where it was important to help the aviation sector to grow, but it's no longer the case, of course, today. So talking about uh, jet fuel uh, taxing to support uh, vulnerable countries, uh, essentially, uh, will lead us to talk about uh, decarbonating our economy and then um, funding the aid for vulnerable countries, including the uh, loss and damages uh, funds from uh, COP26. In other words, we knew we need new sources for funding and um, the uh, jet fuel tax is uh, one opportunity to do that and using that uh, tax to help uh, vulnerable countries or countries vulnerable to climate change is uh, something that makes a lot of sense. And the Orlando report of 2004, uh, it was already this idea of uh, taxing um, negative uh, spillover uh, effects and pollution was one of them. So what I'm going to try and uh, do in my brief um, intervention is to talk about three main issues. First of all, Go back, uh, go back to the upside and downsides of uh, that tax as an innovative uh, funding stream. Then I'll talk about uh, the uh, tax more specifically. And then thirdly, I will uh, talk about the uh, potential implementation of uh, this, uh, this uh, tax and uh, share a couple of uh, similar examples. So what about this earmarked taxation? Well, this is something that uh, is uh, uh, already out there in the uh, literature. The uh, difficulty is the uh, very rigid nature of the affectation of resources, the uh, risk of lack of transparency, and also the uh, lack of uh, democracy. And it means that it's harder, harder sorry, to have an oversight uh, body. So this is um, uh, something that we've already heard uh, in the first uh, session, and having a uh, earmarked taxation will lead to greater uh, running cost and greater fragmentation. But on, on the upside, it allows you to secure a multi-year uh, funding. It also allows it to be more acceptable or deemed more acceptable by taxpayers. And uh, it also is very efficient in reaching um, the end beneficiaries. 
So it brings about some elements of uh, democracy. For example, if there is uh, no clear political majority, then earmarked taxation is probably the uh, best way to approve spending. So what is the uh, situation right now for earmarked uh, taxation? Well, look, if you look at France and the figures for uh, 2018, you can see that there are 150 different earmarked uh, taxes that uh, amount to 28.6 billion euros, uh, not including social security and not uh, including uh, regional taxes. If you include those, uh, well, you reach 26% of all taxes in France. But that set aside, um, it's essentially uh, uh, taxation that uh, is earmarked to culture and protecting the environment. And then there's also the taxation that is levied and paid into the uh, Development Solidarity Fund with uh, the airfare uh, taxation, for example, and the uh, Development uh, Solidarity Fund is uh, is funded, yes, on this uh, tax on uh, airline uh, tickets. Now, on the... Uh, international level, uh, earmarking for uh, health projects involves some 80 uh, countries, that's the figures for 2017, and what we notice is that uh, there's a continuation in the uh, earmarking. Uh, in other words, the earmarking is very uh, strict, it's not really integrated into uh, the uh, budgets, And in the topic that we are currently looking at, uh, we're, we're looking at internationally earmarked taxation, which raises a whole number of issues. First of all, the commitment of, uh, of governments. Um, earmarking is very rigid, but it also forces and compels countries to uh, commit. So having this uh, commitment, is, I think, a step in the right uh, direction. And then there's, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, multi-year funding, which is very uh, useful, with a lot of, however, uh, issues of cooperation across time, which can be uh, difficult. And then you have uh, the uh, funds that also do insurance, like uh, the uh, compensation funds for uh, uh, maritime um, pollution, though, so the fee poll, as we call them as well. Uh, these funds are also uh, 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 paid into by uh, an international tax. So jet fuel for international uh, air travel is uh, an issue that comes up 20 years after the Lando report. So there's the idea of double dividends, i.e., financing development, but at the same time also reduce uh, CO2. And so this uh, dividend uh, obviously uh, will substitute each other. But the current exemption is completely inconsistent with international climate ambitions as they stand. Moreover, uh, the air sector is rather concentrated with the six producer uh, countries for jet uh, fuel that represent a rather wide uh, tax base and tax can be levied at various stages, refining, storage or even at the delivery stage to the airline. And this tax will be based on the polluter pays principle and will be uh, borne mainly by rich households in rich countries and would benefit countries that are vulnerable to climate change and uh, to global warming. Now, there's been quite a bit of progress made on this issue, but it is, it can be sure, we can be uh, sure that uh, the air sector, the aviation sector, will be a sort of a blind angle when it comes to um, this uh, carbon taxing. Now, let's talk about the potential uh, we estimate that 
uh, we'd be able to collect uh, 18 billion uh, euros annually, um, i.e. 10 percent uh, of total ODA, if you were to look at the latest OECD figures. Now, if you look into some more dynamic aspects, um, things get a bit complicated because the market is um, estimated to grow at 4% per year for the next 15 years. And in the medium and long term, there will be a change in uh, behavior and also in the technical aspects of the aircrafts themselves. And one more essential point is that this tax would allow for a certain level of homogenization of the carbon pricing of fuels. So today jet fuel is uh, taxed at 9.6 euro per tonne as against uh, 71 euros per tonne for petrol or uh, 80 euros per tonne uh, CO2 for diesel. And so you can see that uh, tax treatment for jet fuel is more favorable in general, and there's also the exemption for international flights. So economists have spoken at length about the importance of homogenizing all of this in order to provide the right signals to consumers and to policymakers. Now let's move on to issues of uh, implementation. At the European level, there's a political will to tax uh, jet fuels, uh, as reflected by the revision of the 2003 directive. And there's also the application uh, of emission permits to the aviation sector for um, flights inside of the EU. But all of this is just at the European level. Now, if this were to remain at the European level, then there would be issues of competitiveness and also on the effects of uh, intra-European trade. So it would therefore be preferable to have a larger scale adoption. And so this would require um, a review of all of the bilateral agreements. And that's part of the difficulty of impl implementation. But it would not, and uh, legal experts will correct me here if I'm wrong, require the review of the Chicago Convention itself. Now, there's also that solidarity tax uh, that is now currently uh, levied in nine different countries. In France, this uh, feeds into the Fonds de Solidarité for Development and for um, the, uh, ag the Agence de Financement uh, of Infrastructure of, uh, and Transport in France. And this solidarity tax also feeds into health funds such as the Gavi, uh, Unitaid Medicines, etc. Some of which have been mentioned uh, today. And all of this is well integrated into the French budgetary process. And you can find uh, all of the information on these processes. And this is um, uh, also s uh, supervised by uh, the auditors, etc. Now, there's another, um, so the International Hydrocarbon Pollution Compensation Funds uh, that is uh, um, regulated by the 1971-1992 Convention and the 2003 Protocol for the Supplementary Fund. So these are compulsory contributions collected by the IOPC funds outside the budget budgetary process. And taxpayers um, uh, have to pay to companies that store oil on the territory of the member countries. So the 1992 fund has 8 million pounds annually with compensation that was um, given out to the tune of 1.3 million, 1. 3 million uh, euros. So our recommendation to be in line with um, what others 
sessions have uh, discussed, uh, uh, sessions that were organized by the IMF and uh, sessions here too, um, is to make use of existing funds uh, and to also levy a tax that is integrated into states' budgetary processes to ensure transparency and uh, oversight. So to conclude, let me leave you with four uh, main messages. Firstly, an international earmark tax will help um, make more tangible the annual commitments of uh, various actors and also overcome difficulties when it comes to international cooperation. Now, the details of implementation are also important. That's my second message. We should try and avoid adding to the fragmentation and to the inefficiency that has already been criticized at length today. Thirdly, uh, tax inject fuel uh, would also um, remedy uh, an inconsistency that exists today in carbon finance pricing. And lastly, this is in the spirit of the sum summit for a new global finance uh, financial deal. And this would also help reduce emissions across the world while at the same time uh, combating poverty. Thank you, Vianney, for this very clear presentation on uh, taxing jet uh, fuel. Is Grégoire online with us? Grégoire had told us that he would be available starting 5.15. Fabien, do you have Grégoire with us? Yes, I can still see him, says Fabien. I can see him online, but his mic uh, is uh, has been turned off, so I am unaware as to whether he is, in fact, with us. So in that case, um, let me move on to Alice. Uh, could uh, you perhaps uh, go over your presentation, and then uh, uh, Grégoire will take the floor later. Can you all hear me properly? Thank you very much for your invitation. Thank you for the presentation of this um, paper, which seems uh, perfectly relevant to feed into the, today's uh, discussion and the discussion at large uh, uh, on the reform of uh, development financing. So at I4C, we work on development banks and now on how they can better respond to climate objectives. We also seek to contribute to such discussions and to respond to the presentation that has just been made. Let me sort of take a larger, take a step back and give you a larger picture to talk to you about the a comprehensive uh, context of this of such attacks because I think that this paper helps us better identify how to better respond to the uh, issues of uh, fragmentation of development aid and find more financing sources and uh, try and finance more sectors and more activities. And we need to think about how these supplementary sources of financing can be better used, best used rather, for a more sustainable transition in developing countries. So firstly, in the first session, we spoke about fragmentation, about the complexification of um, the ODA system today. The system is increasingly complex, new funds that emerge, but are still incapable of responding to needs of development, but also to climate needs, biodiversity needs, and to also um, uh, provide compensation for loss and damages, especially in a context today where crises are more frequent and increasingly complex. And so we need to find supplementary sources of financing. In a few days' time, we'll be discussing about uh, uh, what multilateral development banks uh, uh, will say about all of this during the spring assemblies and the spring meetings of the IMF and uh, the World Bank. And uh, in the framework of the Working Group 4 on uh, innovative uh, financing um, instruments, we're also looking at additional sources of financing that will be necessary in the future. But despite all of this, we need to be prepared for the eventuality that even if we uh, 
managed to find other sources of financing, even if we find supplementary sources of uh, uh, money to finance developing, well, we might not be able to respond to all of the needs. So we basically need to be able to finance better. So I think it's better to take off uh, from the conclusion uh, from the, of the previous session, i.e. start at national levels. We spoke about country platforms. So this is something that's really interesting in today's context. However, today there is a sort of lack for a business plan for these kinds of pl country platforms. There's a Paris Agreement today and there are the SDGs that call upon all countries to develop trajectories for sustainable development, to uh, also achieve climate goals, uh, biodiversity goals and social goals, etc. Et but these trajectories of development in the long term can be a valuable tool to steer action for financing aid, enabling us to identify the sectoral transformations that are necessary and where public intervention is really necessary. And once again, I'll go back to what was said in the first session. Indeed, today, sustainable development should be encouraged first and foremost by domestic efforts. So, indeed, we need to develop uh, financing plans for this transition to identify what can be domestically financed by this private sector, by the public sector, and to also identify actions where international aid will become completely indispensable and necessary so that this international aid can be targeted towards where they really are necessary and most efficient. So once these needs have been identified, it's only then that we can develop, thanks to country platforms, develop coordination between various actors of development and also identify who is the best equipped to respond to these very specific development needs. So for instance, if um, you're looking at uh, uh, financing uh, losses and damages and or financing biodiversity, etc. So, so you can look at these subjects once, only once you've looked at the coordination of the various actors. And development banks can play a major role. For instance, the fund for losses and damage, that's really interesting. Uh, that's a really interesting uh, solution. But what we're really interested in is uh, to know what you think about the jet fuel tax. Yes, the jet fuel tax is a very interesting notion because that's a source of additional financing. And the earmarking of the resources can complement the resources of development banks that will aim at financing specific trajectories of development of specific countries and can also be targeted to very specific issues. Um, let me just play uh, the devil's advocate here. Perhaps this idea for jet fuel tax will, be, will meet with a lot of uh, opposition. What do you say to that? Go ahead. I think it'll depend on at what level this will be implemented. Because if it is at the global scale, well, there will be no question of competitivity. The question, I think, is the jet fuel tax will be implemented at the European level, which is perhaps going to be the case uh, soon. 
what's going to do what's going to happen to intra-European exchanges uh, and competitivity and also competitivity with regard to the countries that are outside of the EU. So I think that's why it would be interesting at the summit to discuss about this tax at the international level and not just at the European level. Well, I can see that Grégoire has just joined us. Perhaps you've listened to everything that was just said. Yes. Uh, could you come in? Do you share what was said by uh, Alice and uh, Vianney? Uh, and perhaps our public also, uh, our audience here also has something to say. Grégoire, the floor is yours. Terribly sorry, I was stuck in traffic in Clermont-Ferrand. Yes, Vianney has summarized uh, the paper on the question of lack of competitivity in case only one or a few countries were to levy this tax. I think we need to consider the fact that, and this we have looked into detail at the legal aspects of the Supreme Court of America that authorized uh, the state of Florida to levy this tax even for international flights. Because the bilateral accord, bilateral agreement uh, does not cover uh, the state's laws. And so Florida, as well as Georgia, two major airports levy taxes on jet fuel for international flights on storage uh, and on other aspects as well. And this hasn't led to a re reduction of uh, airport activity. And one of the airports uh, in which the passengers pay the most taxes is the airport of Heathrow in London. The, it's almost reaching a, a saturation, capacity saturation point. Uh, but you can see that taxes haven't uh, led to a reduction in passenger flow. The non-taxation of jet fuel on international flights is actually a result of a heavy lobbying from air companies, whereas in fact an introduction of jet fuel taxation could uh, promote Airbus and Boeing and other aircraft manufacturers to renew their fleet and also reduce the gap between uh, jet fuel and biofuels currently, the gap that exists currently. Yes, I'd like to remind you why both of these sessions were planned uh, uh, together the same afternoon. Uh, the fragmentation and earmark taxes and especially tax on jet fuels. So there's a fragmentation of the sources of financing. That's the problem here. But that does not prevent a perfect coordination when it comes to the flow of these taxes towards organizations when they're well or coordinated. So let me try and link up these two subjects. And so here's my question to all of you. What is the future for this? There might be a slight window for taxing jet fuels, but are there other fields that you think might be interesting? Uh, are there other fields in which your mark taxes can be designed without leading to any distortion that can lead to new sources of mobilization? I would just like to say one thing. We've also worked a lot on aid taxation in Ferdi, which is another aspect we've worked on uh, with, uh, with a tax waiver or non-taxation in developing countries. And actually the CAD at the OECD is evolving to towards accepting the non-taxation of aid in countries that, uh, that benefit is from this aid. And sometimes it represents two or three percent of their GDP that is not being taxed. So here we're talking about taxation before a national level allocation of resources. 
at the, at the international level, there's probably two main taxes that uh, are being uh, discussed. Une taxe sur le carburant des, des navires. First, a tax on uh, ship fuel, which is quite similar to the aircraft fuel tax. However, there's a few uh, differences, which is why actually we uh, preferred actually mentioning a jet fuel tax on in, in our uh, document because jet fuel is, is more complex to manufacture when compared to uh, ship fuel. And so there's less players, uh, le less manufacturers, which means it's easier to tax. And secondly, passengers uh, who will have to actually bear the, car, bear the burden of this tax, of a jet fuel tax, it's mostly uh, rich households in rich countries. Whether, whereas if we tax uh, ship uh, the fuel, then we actually tax indirectly the trade of uh, many uh, goods, including goods that are being shipped to developing countries. So it wouldn't be quite the same um, population that would actually bear the burden of this tax. And then another tax that could be also uh, looked into is a tax on financial transactions which is actually on the agenda on, of our June summit. And there's also another one that would be a tax on uh, electronic trade. And again, I think we will also uh, speak about it in June. And I'm, I don't, I'm not an expert on this, so I won't say much. At the time of the Landau report, report about 20 years ago, and even before, I suggested quite imprudently to levy a tax on medicine. And so a very low tax actually uh, allowed to raise a uh, vast amount of money for the WHO. But maybe we could actually have a voluntary tax on medicine because paying just 1% more on the medicine that we consume uh, in a spirit of solidarity. Well, there's a sort of a logic of a voluntary contribution that could have an impact. At the time when I mentioned it, uh, it, it remained under the radar and didn't go very far, but it's a suggestion. So sorry, Alice, I interrupted what you wanted to say. Yes, one more. Th I would like to come back on this idea of new taxes that are being considered. At the moment, the task force is working on those different possibilities uh, in, in the lead up to the June summit in Paris. And the objective of this task force is really to look into the whole set of possibilities, but also to identify the main principles to levy finan uh, additional taxes, to find additional financing with that negative impact on development. And also, I would like to stress again that we're talking about additional financing, uh, and this additional financing comes on top of an already complex system. And also today, we need to work towards rationalizing, like uh, streamlining this system that is quite complex to make sure that we really can answer financial needs in countries. Thank you. So now we just have another 15 left to take your questions on this uh, session, or maybe also to ask questions that were uh, for the previous session. Alain Leroy, is there any question you may want to ask? Alain, please, you, you need to turn your microphone. Yeah, the question for Mr. Dico is asking, if the uh, tax on jet fuel will not actually rise the cost of air transport in developing countries. So it would be, I think you, maybe you mentioned it, but it would be good to come back to it. And also you mentioned the Lando report, and I was actually part of the team of this report at the time. And we uh, actually concluded that we could just have uh, taxes just 
uh, on uh, jet fuel just in some countries, not all countries in the world had to do it for it to be efficient. For example, Brazil did not want to do it. And we also said that this jet fuel tax could be a precursor like that to other taxes, like for example, financial transaction taxes. We also had the idea of the tax on maritime straits and also to answer uh, Adema's question when it comes to uh, climate change financing, well, the magnitude and finances, or financing or magnitude of needs is $2,000 billion. That's how much we would need. And now I also had a question on the jet fuel tax, which is a very interesting topic. As you know, now the ICIO is uh, headed by a, a, a Chinese person. The head of uh, the ICIO is, is Chinese. And so this may have an impact. And do you already have an idea of what, how, what impact this could have? What would be the Chinese interest there? But before, could you please answer the first question by the, the audience on uh, the rising of uh, plane tickets because of the tax? So thank you. Now I would like to ask something about the previous session. There's actually four points that I wanted to raise. I'll try to do it very quickly. First, on the general notion of uh, the on of fragmentation. I mean, I thought the document was great, but I believe maybe there could be more detailed, more details, more specification between uh, to separate like uh, the public financing of development and in, including like an, uh, internal uh, financing and also to explain what aid comes from those uh, this type of financing because in your discussion the, the lines were blurred so we were not sure if we were talking about fragmentation of aid or if we're talking about fragmentation of public financing of development to public development finance and the second point I wanted to raise is to identify a bit better where do those funds uh, come? Where do the funds come from? What are the initiatives that lead to the setting up of those new funds? And here I suspect that just the mere fact of having this type of initiatives contributes to the uh, is linked to specific agendas and specific interests. And those agendas are linked to external uh, interests and external needs. So maybe we should look into this uh, a bit deeper to know what what is the origin of the initiatives, what what, what agendas uh, are at play here, to better understand that who manages what. Uh, third point: the question of governance of uh, of the whole uh, development finance. So here I may be a bit provocative, but when we speak about coordination, well, we have the uh, Bretton Woods institutions that are uh, headed by uh, financiers, by finance ministries, where the United States, the United Nations are managed by uh, diplomats and ambassadors. And the relationship and the consistency between those two actors at the international level will raise the same difficulties than it does at the national level. And we all know that the relationship between finance and foreign affairs is not always very easy. And so we need to recognize this. This is a very fact of the international environment. We need to understand the DNA of each institutions and, and, act, and stakeholder. And then, then if we translate this at the local level, then obviously we have complexities and complications. And so if even if everyone makes uh, every eff possible effort for coordination, everyone improves coordination. Well, again, who takes part in coordination at the EU, for example, it's ambassadors. Who coordinates with the UN is the uh, UNDP uh, uh, representative that has a coordination role at the local level. And then who is in charge of coordination with the uh, World Bank, for example? Uh, it, it, it would be the Ministry of Finance. So sometimes, yeah, it, 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 this can work. 
for example, I remember when I was working in Mexico, well, the way it worked in Mexico was efficient. There was only one person in charge. And in India and Indonesia, uh, it was the same, whether it's the World Bank, the United Nations or uh, USAID. Well, I, I only saw one and the same person every time. Uh, which was good, even though there were probably struggles in the country between uh, the different interests of foreign affairs and uh, uh, national financing. But anyway, I think the question of really finding like consistency uh, here is very important. So I will uh, repeat to the different questions. So the easiest uh, answer is the one uh, by the ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization. We'd actually asked, asked them if they wanted to take part to our round table. This went all the way up to Montreal, but we never received an answer. So we do not really know what their position is. And then the other thing I wanted to say about the jet fuel tax, it's well, in China is actually the second uh, biggest player here when it comes to uh, jet fuel uh, manufacturing, but also the number of flights. So it's a very important point for, for them and seems very important to know what China's position is. As for uh, the, the question about uh, the price hike because of this jet fuel in developing a uh, jet fuel tax in developing uh, countries, well, this tax would be levied on international flights. It would not actually be levied on national or domestic flights, which are subjected to local national tax uh, regimes. And also when it comes to the price of a uh, Nair ticket in uh, countries as the question of elasticity. If we were like in the con in the situation of fair and equal competition, then it would be the same impact on every ticket. But in developing countries, there's no pure and perfect competition when it comes to air travel. So it may actually not have a very strong impact on on the price of uh, air tickets. Yes, I agree. I believe uh, the price of uh, plane tickets in Africa, uh, well, in Africa, you actually have a monopoly from African uh, air companies or even French air companies. And as for the ICAO, uh, it's very much influenced by the IATA. And so to decarbonize their industry, they have different plans, but they never ever envisage a tax or they never consider the idea to correct this lack of jet fuel tax. So they have a very uh, biased approach. Please, please, could you please speak in the microphone? So a question for Alain Leroy. Among the questions that you've uh, that is received, obviously they're all interesting. But is is one of them actually standing out, uh, and is maybe about something we've not uh, broached yet? So I will relay the different questions that we've received, like to summarize them. So we're being asked if the jet fuel tax is not contrary to the uh, World Trade Organization's principles. Grégoire, do you want to answer this question? question. Once again, the WTO, as, well, sorry, what Vianney mentioned very quickly is that the Chicago Convention from 1944 prohibited taxing jet fuel that was in the tanks on board. So that actually this, this jet fuel on board the plane was not treated, was not processed like it it was a jet fuel importation that was submitted to uh, 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 taxes for importation taxes. However, there can be excise taxes that are levied on uh, on jet fuel. Uh, 
And there's also now also this mechanism to adjust taxes at the border uh, at the EU, which is being levied and which the World Trade Organization actually has asked the EU to, to levy. But if not, I believe the WTC has something else to do than just to consider the question of a uh, jet fuel tax. Already the, comp the carbon compensation scheme that is being set up by the EU is much more sensitive and much more complicated. Also, uh, I just had one question. The interpreter apologizes that a very strong echo. I just wanted to ask, what would we do with this tax if it's being levied? It's, it, I heard that it would be given to developed countries, but it's quite a generic approach. So would it be actually earmarked for something specific? Well, I think this really uh, brings us back to the debate we were having earlier. So one first avenue would be, for example, to finance the uh, loss and damage fund that was created after COP27. So maybe a jet fuel tax could be used there to replenish this fund. But coming back to what we said earlier, I think we should not really be looking into creating new funds so as to not uh, make the fragmented uh, landscape even more complex. So I, I would like to come back because I believe it's a very interesting question that actually links both our sessions together. And so the idea is to having a to earmark to have an earmarked fund for a very specific objective can be very much uh, justified although this contributes to fragmentation so the lines are blurred so how far can we actually justify uh, to use earmarked resources for a good cause and at the same time find a way to not fragment the landscape even more to increase this fragmentation because you're just demonstrating now that actually we can contribute to fragmentation in a very positive way. Yeah, this, this, it's, this comes back to the question of optimal fragmentation, which could be maybe a, a next debate. The it would also be maybe a good uh, idea to look into the efficiency of these funds, why are they earmarked and to whom they are destined. And it's also, also important to demonstrate that earmarking a fund is necessary. If this is demonstrating, this is already worth something. Yes, I would just like to react to what has just been said. Um, indeed, I think that it is important, and to some extent it uh, justifies the importance of uh, matching this uh, need for environmental, for biodiversity issues with some funding, and to match it also with the uh, social and economic development pathway of uh, countries. So it's important to, to have this, and then for development banks and for specialized funds, it's important also to identify which are the needs and to uh, meet them uh, properly. Ear earmarked uh, funds and uh, development banks uh, have uh, objectives to uh, allocate 50% of their resource for, let's say, climate. Now, this has uh, pushed up their capacity to fund climate-related projects, but it's also a kind of uh, uh, incentive to always fund very large projects and green large projects. So they might be uh, funding the umpteenth uh, wind farm 
rather than uh, helping the uh, ministry to have its own uh, transition strategy and uh, develop the uh, sector, the wind sector as a whole. So there is a need to uh, look at uh, the uh, demand, to look at all the uh, social and economic uh, development pathways and to uh, uh, see which are the funds that are the more relevant. And for loss and damages, I think it's important or interesting uh, to have a specific fund because the financing needs are going to be specific. We're going to need uh, a lot of money and quickly, so it could be useful to have a uh, specific uh, fund in that uh, regard. We have a gentleman on the phone, unfortunately, and the microphone is picking up his conversation and the interpreters apologize, we couldn't hear everything. We have a question here from the uh, room, a question on the uh, summit that will uh, take place uh, in June. I was wondering whether uh, jet fuel taxation would be uh, on uh, the agenda of the summit. Well, no one knows at uh, the minute. It's uh, really very early days. I don't think that at uh, the uh, summit we'll be uh, making any decisions on taxation. We might agree on some uh, general principles on how to, you know, trade off development and uh, climate. What about concessional uh, lending? What about multi-dimensional vulnerability? So I think that we're going to have some broad guiding principles, but I don't think that we'll come out with uh, a, uh, a uh, decision on taxation. And then there'll be the G20 uh, summit uh, in uh, the autumn, and there you might have a decision on jet fuel taxation. Thank you very much. Uh, does anyone else want to take the floor? Um, Otherwise, I think that uh, we might have to uh, leave it uh, there. And uh, I understand that we can't have the uh, room forever. So I would like to thank uh, Grégoire, who's got nothing to say, I believe. No, nothing. Okay, thank you very much to all the uh, participants. Thank you very much to uh, those who have uh, drafted this uh, uh, proposal. Thank you very much for the comments that have been uh, made, both by uh, panel members and people in the room. Thank you very much for uh, bearing with us and uh, we'll uh, see you for the uh, fourth uh, event. This is the third installment, third of six in the run-up to uh, the uh, summit. And the next uh, event will be uh, in collaboration with the uh, Fintan Lab uh, Laboratory at the uh, Banque de France on uh, Friday at half past two, I believe. Sorry, two o'clock, not half past two, but two o'clock. It's uh, the Easter weekend, so we'll have to finish earlier than today. And it's uh, organized with the Finden Lab, Ferdi, and the Banque de France. And then the next event will take place on May the 22nd. It will be a long uh, one day event where we'll be uh, discussing the uh, private sector and its uh, role in development financing, including uh, agriculture. But we'll talk about SMEs, about uh, larger companies, and, uh, and explain how we can help uh, vulnerable countries take off on their development uh, trajectory. I'd like to remind you also, also that the preparatory documents for all of these events are available on the uh, Ferdi website in French and in English. You've got the full length, full length document and sometimes you have a summary. So don't hesitate to go on the Ferdi website. Thank you very much.